Hey everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. Uh, today, as I always am, but I am excited for this one. Um, I've been hearing about this one for quite some time. Uh, I've seen some stuff earlier. It looks pretty cool. So we have uh, uh, Alex Black here today is going to be talking about, in his capacity from the Great Juno Beach Center, about their new temporary exhibition uh, from DF to Juno. Uh, I will let him introduce all that stuff. I'm just going to give him a quick intro and say I've seen some stuff before in a little more detail. I've seen the PowerPoint. There's some pretty cool stuff here, and it looks like it's going to be a really, really good one. So this will give us an insight into the content and, and uh, the direction narrative, I guess is the best word to use, and, and all of that. And as always, please, uh, at any time, ask questions. If you have questions or about the exhibit, what it's going to be done with it, how it's going to be, uh, anything really, just just fire away. It's always great to have questions and see the sidebar chat really get uh, get into it. So it's it's always a great thing to see and always happy to have it. So please please do fire away if you have any questions or comments or anything like that, and uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. So Alex, thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate you uh, coming on the channel. Uh, a little less uh, Saturday afternoon, well for us, a little Saturday afternoon programming on uh, OTD. So I really appreciate it. How's it going today? Oh, it's going really well. Really excited to be here. Uh, really excited that our temporary exhibit, this is, today is the first day over in France that it's open to the public. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, oh, the inauguration mm -hmm. happened. So, you know, all the, um, you know, VIPs were there, you know, representatives of the Canadian government, the French government, the French regional yeah. governments and all that stuff. So that's all out of the way now. And, you know, uh, people can start to visit it. And uh, the exhibit for anybody who's interested will be there at least until the end of 2023. So that does give you some Perfect. time if you want to plan a trip. Uh, and maybe it'll be there longer. We'll see. <laughs> Yeah, you never know. I mean, uh, I just, this is an aside, uh, completely relate to nothing else. But everyone's like, oh, what's the plan? And I'm like, the last two years told me not to say, you know, end dates of open plans. <laughs> so not a bad thing to uh, to, to not have uh, an open, you know, to have an open end on things, especially like this. I think that's a really, really good idea. So more people can experience the exhibit in person if that, that's uh, something they're able to do, which is great. So, um, so I guess I'll just, I always ask this question, as you know, uh, and it's not really part of the PowerPoint, but I, I hopefully you can speak about it a little bit. Is how does how did this come up? How did this? Where did this come from? Right, this it's it's not an odd connection. Obviously, if you know Canadian military history of the Second World War, especially, you know why these are connected. But I'm just wondering, like, if you could talk about like a little bit, maybe the background of where this kind of came from and how this kind of started. Yeah, so absolutely. I mean, if you've ever been to the Juno Beach Center, I know you have, Brad, but not everybody has. Yeah. Um, yes. It is a Second World War museum. It is not just a D-Day museum. So it covers kind mm -hmm. of all of Canada's, you know, Second World War uh, contributions to victory um, and also some cultural stuff from before and after the war. And so each campaign itself yep. usually has a pretty small building within the museum because there's only so much space to tell every story. And mm. the upgrade has a space, but it's not a very, you know, it's not a particularly large space. So this was an opportunity for us to do a detailed dive into that. The other side of it is, um, especially over the last couple of years, um, you know, we had 100,000 visitors in 2019 for the major anniversary. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And now, in particular, we're very reliant on European visitors. Um, and we've always been reliant on European visitors. Yeah. I mean, even in the pre-pandemic year, you know, 75, 80 percent of our visitors were European and a good chunk of those were French. And so the DF raid is a really great uh, subject for that because it's something that happened in France in you know upper Normandy in fact and uh, yeah. it had implications for the French local French population which is something I perhaps won't cover as well as I wish I could in this uh, PowerPoint slide mm -hmm. show but right. nevertheless it's a really important component of our exhibition what was the civilian experience what, you know how did yeah. they feel about what was going on and, and we'll talk about it a little bit today um, so that's a really important component of it. And then, of course, this year is the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. Mm -hmm. um, it'll probably be the last year mm -hmm. in which any Dieppe Raid, last major anniversary year in which any, you know, yeah. Dieppe Raid veterans are alive because they tend to be a little older than, say, Normandy or Northwest Europe veterans. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a really great opportunity to pay tribute to them and, and what they went through. Um, and... Uh, yeah, take take advantage of that anniversary to you know get the story out there again and and to provide it to people in perhaps more of a nuanced or at least a, a broader perspective on it in terms of the subjects mm. we cover in today's talk. Right, and I, and I just yeah just jump in there real quick because like I said, you you always have in slides obviously <laughs> that I'll get to in a second, but yeah. You, you... 
he asked me to a couple weeks ago now. I don't know. Time has been flying like crazy for me. Yeah. Uh, just to, you know, give a little insight to some of the stuff that you guys were putting together. And even at that point, I was like, this is, this is good. Right. And I obviously can't stop the historian brain. As I said to you many times, <laughs> can't stop, but you know, I, there was lots of great stuff in there and how the story is being told and everything. It was just, it's great to see that it's getting, this type of um, treatment in the sense of that it's broad. That's what I think is great. Um, like we were talking just before we started, it's not, it's different than sometimes the typical narrative of Dieppe that people may be used to with just the reasons behind the raid. And then that's it, you know, then it goes horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. And then, yeah, there's POWs and it just kind of ends. This looks like it's gonna have the depth that is missing and it's gonna be presented in, I think a very, engaging way and then and a location that you can't beat yeah it's not the app but you, you can't beat normandy just in general because it's a great place uh anyway well, i'll stop talking we'll get the uh, powerpoint going here the, the one thing i'll add to that is actually um yeah. we're actually part of in, there's increasingly a growing you know european liberation route europe kind of program going on and we're trying to link ourselves mm. up with the folks yeah. in Dieppe especially for Canadian audiences, you know, if yep. you're going to go visit France, you know, you got to hit the big three, right? You know, Juno Beach, Dieppe, um, Vimy, right? And perhaps, you know, Beaumont yep. ML and, and, and everything like that, you know. And so we're trying yep. to kind of build that up and, and make Dieppe more, more a part of that as well and to get people to kind of consider mm. if they come to us, you know, maybe go see Dieppe as well. Yeah. Or certainly those from Dieppe may want to come down here and visit us, so... Well, and from, I'm sorry, but from a North American perspective, it's not that far. <laughs> it's really no, not that's, that's that so. far. <laughs> We're used to some distances. So Dieppe and, and, and the Norman beaches, is, is, it's not that far. I mean, yeah, it's still all Normandy, so, so that's great. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we'll get this going and I'll, uh, I'll let you go. Um, hold on. Yeah, so one, one of the notes off the top I'll make here, because you can see the poster image that we've selected, um, this is from the German yep. military archives, um, and many of the photos you will right. see in this were of yep. the aftermath of the raid, and obviously the Canadians and the Allies weren't there to take photographs, the Germans were. And so this is one of yep. the quite impressive photographs. Um, I really like it because, um, I mean, it doesn't seem perhaps, it is posed, obviously, but it doesn't, you know, there's the yep. tank in the background, the ruined tank with the broken bits of its uh, waterproofing, you know, device. It, the incredible amount of barbed wire in the middle, and then just all the helmets that have clearly yeah. been, you know, discarded as the as the POWs were marched off the beach and everything, right? So it kind of yeah. gives you that sense of like the aftermath of this, and um, you know, that's kind of one of the themes of the exhibition. We're not just going to stop it when when the surrender happened. We're going to tell you more of the story. So, yeah, yeah. sorry, I just want to jump in real quick because I think that that's a good point that I think is often forgotten is the the typical pictures and even the film because there's lots of footage of a, the, some of the fighting but also after the fact is german it's not allied right i know it's probably that's once you think about it's common sense but it's something very important to keep in mind and, and i'm sure you guys have thought about that a lot longer than i have so uh <laughs> anyway take us away and kind of explain um what it's going to look like and what we're looking at uh, in the next slide if you want me to keep going yeah hit the next one there and we'll we'll move forward I have to uh, have to do the little uh, bit of uh, PR and say, well, thank yeah. you to all of our sponsors for the exhibition. We have three uh, European or, or French uh, and Belgium sponsors. The War Heritage Institute was absolutely instrumental. They weren't necessarily a sponsor. They were a partner on this exhibition, okay, uh, providing many of the artifacts for the exhibition because in 2017, they did their own Dieppe exhibition for the 75th uh -huh. anniversary. And so we were able to get a lot of artifacts from them, which was really great. A lot of iconography as well, photos, images, that sort of thing. Um, and the, um, Dominique Conrad, who is one of their historians and curators, was very instrumental in helping us to write some of the, the, the pieces in the exhibition. We were sponsored in Canada by C-SPAN Shipyards. Uh, they were very generous uh, in providing us with uh, some money to help fund the exhibition, as well as the French uh, Ministry of Defense, essentially, and the Normandy region. So really, really thankful to all these groups uh, for helping us make the exhibition possible. That's awesome. Go on to the next one there. So this is kind of my my broad presentation outline here. Um, I'll just give a brief introduction to the exhibition, and then we have various zones um, uh, mm. in in the exhibition and in this presentation. Um, and so uh, I just have a little thing to read, and then I'll kind of get into the zones here in a second. So. August 2022 will mark 80 years since the Dieppe Raid, Operation Jubilee. In nine hours, a force of nearly 5,000 Canadians suffered over 800 killed, 
with two-thirds of the force dead, wounded, or captured. Canada's darkest moment of the Second World War remains shrouded in controversy, mystery, and tragedy. For decades, the disaster dominated Canadians' collective memory of the war. So the Juneau Beach Centre is marking this major commemorative milestone with this new temporary exhibition from Dieppe to Juneau, the 80th anniversary of the Dieppe Raid. And the exhibition brings together unique voices of Dieppe that allow visitors to discover the raid's nuance and complexity. From Dieppe to Juneau explores our shifting understanding of the raid, its links to Juneau Beach on D-Day, and the liberation of Dieppe in September 1944. So that kind of gives you an idea of what we're going to try to cover today. So yep. Zone 1, this is kind of the flow of the exhibition when you visit. Zone 1 provides you with the context, what's going on from 1940 to 1942, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, you know, the, you know the, the, we make the point in that kind of zone how the war is not going very well for the Allies at this point, and that kind of has an impact on why the raid is launched in the first place. Zone two, we talk about the raid, and we try to do a, jo um, a good job comparing the plan and what the Allies hoped was going to happen with the reality of what happened, which obviously ended up being a bit of a slaughter, especially for the Canadians. Um, in Zone 3, we shift to propaganda, the raid used as a weapon, and we talk about propaganda on both sides and how the raid was used and weaponized on both sides. In Zone 4, we talk about the experience of captivity and the experiences of prisoners of war, primarily uh, Canadian and Allied prisoners of war, uh, though there are some mentions, though not in this presentation really, of, of German prisoners of war, not so much from the raid, but there are links with like the shackling incidents yeah. and stuff like that. The yeah. And Zone 5, uh, remembering, explaining a failure in a site of victory. And that is one of the main themes of this exhibition, um, is, you know, how do we explain a colossal failure, you know, perhaps one of the worst, you know, Canadian military disasters in history on Juneau Beach, on a site of a great Canadian victory later in the war, right? And and we'll talk a little bit about yeah. that today. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's great. Yeah, sorry, I just, I like, I just wanted to pop yeah. in because I do like... The whole idea, I like the zone idea. I like when I first learned about it, you know, in terms of museums, I was kind of like, uh, now I love it. I think it's great. I love the idea and, I, and I'm glad that that's what you guys decided to do. It, it, that, that makes me happy, I guess, is one way to put it. Because I just like how you get to interact with things. It's great. So the exhibition is also made up of various uh, different types of elements, um, different types of ways we prevent, presented the information. So we've got various biographies, uh, anything from, you know, Private Jack Poulton, who was a yeah. uh, member of the uh, Royal Regiment of Canada on Blue Beach. He survived uh, the Blue, Ble Blue Beach attack. Um, to, you know, Lord Lewis Mountbatten, who is, you know, in charge of Combined Operation Headquarters and is ultimately responsible for the raid. Um, we've got plenty of photographs, you know, both from Allied and uh, German sources. Uh, lots of quotes. These are the voices of Dieppe. You know, again, we have quotes from, you know, some of the leading players uh, in the raid. We have quotes from, you know, privates and, 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 and lowly, you know, participants that way. We have this quote uh, on the screen there from Lieutenant Colonel Cecil Merritt. You know, we were glad to go. We were delighted. We were up against a very difficult situation and we didn't win. But to hell with this business of saying the generals did us dirt. Um, so we're trying to mm. give them, uh, we're trying to give them various perspectives, voices in this exhibition in a way we couldn't possibly do on our own. And it's not just participants of the raid, it's people who experience the raid kind of secondhand, you know, loved ones back at home, uh, French mm -hmm. civilians, for instance, uh, even German civilians, um, uh, war correspondents, that sort of thing, as well as mm. uh, historians in some cases as well, and how we've ref and, and how we've reflected on the raid over the last 80 years or so. Um, anchor and sub-subject uh, text panels kind of standard at museums you know you have text panels yeah. of varying sizes and, and and levels artifacts obviously and we'll try to highlight some of those today as 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 we go along uh although i've relied mostly on uh, 2d images uh, of things obviously can't do much more than that in a in a zoom presentation unless i had a video and i was on site but obviously i'm coming from you to you from guelph ontario so i can't i can't a little a little a little, far, a little far yeah a little bit far um and then the infographics as well and the infographics were actually how i kind of started to build this presentation because there's a whole lot of really cool information yeah. in those infographics yeah. and um you know you'll get to see it you know here today uh you know the, the, the amount of information that we've kind of pulled together uh for this exhibit uh, and with that let's move into um zone one the context if you please so let's take ourselves back to May and June 1940. You know, France is in the process of and was rapidly overrun by the German military. And before France had even surrendered, which they did on June uh, 22nd, 1940, 
Churchill, who had only been installed as prime minister just about a month before, right as the German attack started in the West. Literally. <laughs> he, was, he was already giving thought to raiding the French coast. And he, he wrote this uh, to his military advisor, Major General Hastings Ismay. He said, enterprises must be prepared with specially trained troops of the hunter class who can develop a reign of terror down these coasts. First of all, on the butcher and bolt policy, but later on, or perhaps as soon as we are organized, we could surprise Calais or Bologna, kill and capture the Hungarian, and hold the place until all the preparations to reduce it by siege and he or heavy storm have been made and then away. Well, that's kind of what the Allies hoped the Dieppe raid would be. It didn't quite turn out that way, as we know. Uh, next slide, if you please. No, it did not. So occupied Europe, let's fast forward a little bit into the spring of 1942. So obviously uh, the Germans have occupied France uh, and there's the, the free zone uh, and, uh, that Vichy controls still at this time. Uh, on the Eastern Front, uh, you know, they're, they're still on the advance. Uh, they're preparing, I think, Operation Blue uh, for the summer of 1942. Yep. Um, and so that's, that's where Germany's main focus is right now. It's the Eastern Front. Uh, the war in North Africa is looking very bad for Britain with German and Italian forces uh, threatening British positions in, in Egypt and the Suez Canal, which is kind of the vital link to uh, the empire uh, in, the, in the east. Uh, America is in the war now. Uh, Woohoo, December 1941. Uh, you know, not so great for the people at Pearl Harbor, but probably good for the world. Um, and then, of course, our Canadians at Hong Kong, as you well know, Brad. Um, you read it up, that means. <laughs> yeah, the Japanese are on the march in the Pacific and the Far East, and not much is stopping them at this point. Uh, so things don't look great there. Um, the Americans, for their part, you know, they've already talked with the British and they've agreed on Europe first as their policy for how to prosecute the war. And they're starting to exert pressure on Churchill's government and the British to launch a strike on mainland Europe to assist the Soviets. And the Soviets are also pushing for the same. Anything that the Western allies can do to help them at this time is something they would like to see. So that's kind of the, the general situation. At this time as well, and actually we just passed a major anniversary for one of these, and we're going to be mm -hmm. approaching another later this month, um, mm -hmm. Britain has recently begun, uh, well, they've already started in you know 1940, but you know they're, they're starting to increase the sophistication of their raiding uh, operations on the French coast. So, for instance, in late uh, February of 1942, uh, there's Operation Biting at Bruneval, uh, Bruneval uh, which is there on the map uh, just below kind of London, uh, between Dieppe and corsol sur mer which is where Juno Beach is. And uh, in that operation, they're actually after a Wurzburg uh, radar set. Uh, they want mm -hmm. pieces of that, uh, especially for the bomber war, so that they can better understand uh, the Wurzburg was a close uh, range radar. Yeah. Um, and there's another system called the Freya, which I'll talk about in a second, that's more of a longer range system. And they're trying to kind of better understand how German radar works so they can counter it in the air war uh, that's 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 ongoing. Um, and then, uh, and that was a, one of the first kind of, there was others in, in Norway, but uh, one of the first in France, a combined operation for sure. Like there was, yeah. you know, the paratroops were inserted by air, the, 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 the commandos, you know, fought on the ground and secured um, the assets. Uh, with a, an RAF radar technician, and then they were, you know, uh, they got away by sea, and the Royal Navy showed up to pick them up and everything like that, so combined operation. Uh, the same thing with the Saint-Nazaire raid, the Saint-Nazaire raid, which occurs in later in March uh, 1942. Uh, they're basically trying to um, blow a hole in a, in a, in a di the, the Normandy dry dock there to prevent German warships, large-scale warships, from using it kind of as a repair base. Um, and, uh, you know, there's David O'Keefe has some evidence that perhaps they were after some Enigma, uh, code break, breaking equipment there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, you know, the air force was there, they were, you know, supposed to bomb the town uh, kind of as a diversion in advance, you know, the Navy was there to deliver yeah. the force and to extract them eventually. And then of course the commandos are there, you know, doing their business, very heavy casualties on that raid, of course. Um, but it was a huge kind of propaganda success in particular, and they did end up, you know, you know, destroying the dry dock. So um, perhaps it was worth worth the sacrifice, though it was very heavy. Um, Sorry, so I was great... just going to jump yeah. in real quick. Finch uh, trade, everybody drink. Yeah, heard... <laughs> it's a running joke on my channel on World War II TV with Paul At uh, Woodatch. <laughs> Finch trade and, and Ultra. Are, are the joke right if it gets said you know a certain and i've not and i've not mentioned a certain individual uh, might appear out of nothing um, but anyway it's just a joke 
And I've not mentioned some of the uh, raids that go in in Norway in 1941 yeah. in particular, and, and some of those were pinch raids. Uh, they did actually get, you know, Enigma uh, machines, yeah. components, and uh, and code books and that sort of thing. So th these things are going on. Um, and the raids are becoming larger and more complex, uh, once again, under the leadership of Combined Operations Headquarters. And I'll get you to switch to a lovely image. I believe it's going to be Mount Batten on our screen in a second. Or no, we're going to talk, talk about the Battle of Atlantic first thing to talk about Mount, Mount Batten. Sorry. <laughs> Um, so the other part, the other important piece of context to understand, I think, is the status of the Battle of the Atlantic and what's going on at, at, in the war at sea at this time. So 1942 is a very negative time for the Allies, even though the Germans have come or the Germans, the, the Americans have come into the war. Yeah. Um, this has actually increased the ability of the U-boats to find and sink, um, you know, uh, shipping, especially off the coast of the United States, uh, and yeah. the kind of second happy time uh, the U-boat kind of captains referred to it as. Yeah. Um, the other component is in February of 1942, the Allies lose the ability to read um, the Enigma traffic that the, the German U-boats are sending between one another and between uh, themselves and their headquarters with uh, Grand Admiral. Donuts. And uh, basically, they've, um, and, and David O'Keefe would sit here and, and do this much better than I could, but basically, <laughs> they switched over to a four rotor Enigma machine, which is much more complicated, much harder for the, the code breakers at Bletchley Park to break into. And one of the things that, uh, you know, convoy and, 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 and Atlantic defense, a big part of it is simply avoiding the enemy, right? Yep. It's, you know where the U-boats are, so you don't sail there. You sail around. Don't go there. <laughs> and if you can avoid that, you can avoid you know, significant losses. And unfortunately, from February of 1942 to November of 1942, this is impossible. And so the loss rates go up significantly. So in this period, you know, the, the Germans are sink, they sink, you know, something like, uh, this is for the whole year, I think, but uh, 1,300 mm -hmm. or more, you know, yeah. um, allied, you know, cargo vessels for the loss of only 87 u-boats um and and this is you know at the end of the day the allies do want to get back into europe they do want to you know take the fight to nazi germany when they're ready but they can't do it before they're ready and the atlantic lifeline is absolutely essential to getting all the supplies you know the men from america and from canada uh, that they need in order to launch that invasion so if they can't secure these sea lanes uh they can't do that and therefore you know certainly you know david o'keefe would do a better job of explaining this than me you know, they need to break that Enigma code again. And so they're looking for ways in which to do that. And that is part of the context for the DF parade, as, as, as we'll discuss uh, more in a second as well. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So here's, here's Mount Batten. There he is. Uh, Lord Lewis <laughs> Mount Batten, the chief of combined operations. So he's he's ultimately responsible um, for the DF raid, uh, I, I think is fair to say. And, and certainly that was what his, his title you know, he rose to power very, very quickly in, you know, the year or so before the Dieppe raid. You know, he went from commanding a destroyer to an aircraft car carrier to suddenly he's a he's a temporary member of the Joint Chiefs or the, the combined, not the combined chiefs, the chiefs of staff in the UK. Yeah. And um, and and he's also promoted to, you know, vice admiral and, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I guess it'd be air marshal and uh, yes. lieutenant general all at the same time. Yeah. So it's an unparalleled rise in rank and he's, you know, he, he does a good job of building up combined operations, but, you know, maybe he's kind of building his own fiefdom or empire in the process because, you know, and we'll, we'll, you know, he wants to be seen as the guy who is, you know, going to lead us back into into Europe, you know, on what eventually becomes D-Day. Um, so he's he's pushing the Dieppe raid forward, you know, as, as part of this. Um, General Harry Crear, he's not only a, le a lieutenant general, he might even still be a major general. Maybe he's a lieutenant general at this time. Um, major general, I believe. Yeah, yeah, major at this time. Doesn't really matter. Um, yeah, he's he is uh, from the end of kind of 1941, but certainly early in 1942, he becomes the first Canadian Corps commander as yeah. the Canadian Army expands to become, you know, the first Canadian Army, and and McNaughton yeah. is elevated to that position, and he is eventually designated the military officer responsible for the raid. I think I believe before him it was technically Montgomery, uh, but Montgomery was sent um, to North Africa to deal with that situation. Um, and so he becomes the military officer responsible. And Crear is his Canadian general. He is very much a big part of the reason why the Canadians ended up at Dieppe, um, because you know uh, him and both both him and McNaughton uh, were pushing for the Canadians to get involved be, to get involved somehow in the war. 
Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, I actually have some quotes here um, from, from both of these gentlemen. Um, I'll start with Creer's, which is at the bottom. Um, it will be a tragic humiliation if American troops get in action before Canadians who have been waiting in England for three years. So that is the attitude kind of at Canadian High Command. They see the Dieppe Raid as an opportunity to get the Canadians involved in a military action. Uh, then on uh, uh, Lord Lewis Mountbatten's part, you know, he says, you know, my responsibility was pre to prepare for the invasion. And in the meantime, I was to carry on with the commando raids to keep our offensive spirit alive, learn the technique of landing on the enemy occupied coasts and keep the Nazi on the qui vive. So, you know, on their toes, essentially. Um, yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of his general mandate. And so, you know, that's kind of where he's coming from in terms of his later comments on how, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, on how the Dieppe raid led to perhaps success on D-Day, at least that's his 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 wording. And same that was his uh, that was his thing for a very very long time. Yes, anyway, yes. sorry, I couldn't. I can't help myself. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have booed. Yeah. I can't help myself when it comes to Mountbatten. Just just so yeah. many things. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so next, obviously next things, I guess. <laughs> there my hair. So next, we'll talk about the various force commanders. And I know I'm skipping over a lot here. I just don't have time. Yeah, I'm, I, I can't just talk about the planning of the raid here today. It would take, you know, the entire well, episode. Can I ask a quick that. question then? If, if, if yeah, okay. you can. Um, do you, uh, oh, sure. in, in the exhibit in, uh, now how, do I, how do I say this? Do you touch on the fact, maybe this will come up later because I did a quick run through of the slides, uh, of how this was technically two different operations? Like, do you talk about how yes. first it was Operation Rudder and then Jubilee? Yes, absolutely we do. We talk about the difference in the planning and how the plan evolved over time uh, and how, um, you know, um, you know, basically the plan evolves in a number of ways for perhaps individually good reasons. You know, yeah. they remove yeah. the air bombardments because, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll compromise surprise. It'll hurt civilians. Yeah. It may actually make the, the, the troops diff job more difficult on the beaches because if you make more roadblocks for the Germans, then they can defend those areas better. Yeah. Um, you know, all perhaps good reasons, but at the end of the day, they didn't have the, the, the support they needed. Um, the tanks, for instance, there was an original plan for the tanks to land on yeah. the flanks yeah. and to eventually envelop the town from, from those directions, but they would have to cross rivers to do that. And the, the commanders were worried that they wouldn't even be able to make it into Dieppe um, if, if they did it that way. And ultimately, the plan was for the, uh, the extraction to occur from the Dieppe beaches. So if they didn't make it to Dieppe, that really is a problem because you don't have a plan to extract them from the beaches you originally started out at. So there's a whole bunch of individual reasons why the plan was, was changed. And obviously, Rudder... Rudder was cancelled. Um, uh, I know certainly David O'Keefe talks about it as maybe not being completely cancelled uh, and that sort right. of thing. It right. was, you know, cancelled, one, because of um, the weather didn't work out for them at the time right. in July of 1942, and two, uh, because uh, there was a, a, an inadvertent air raid on some of the ships that were assembling for the raid, and so it, it got put on perhaps it wasn't canceled but it was paused and then you know eventually mm. the remount happens and Mountbatten's part of the reason the remount happens uh, certainly and we can talk about that in a little bit but also um uh, Creerar and the Canadians were you know helping to dr him drive that bus as well and, and oh yeah and, for and, sure and, uh, uh, so and, before we move on to the the individual force commanders because I think that's that's important because individuals in this level really matter I uh, just a couple of funny comments one of our everyone's favorites uh, who, who we all <laughs> pretend we don't know who he is but we all do is only getting back <laughs> that line sorry i couldn't help myself when it's such a so i'm sorry but when it's a dark topic having a little bit of levity is always a good thing in my opinion um i thought that was funny we actually we have a question um and, and i've done quite a bit of work on this myself but i think it's a good question kind of even if we just do it quickly is the inaction of canadians in england or in britain Policy. Yeah, and I think there's there's a backdrop to this story where um, McNaughton and Creer are actually get kind of permission from the Canadian government to kind of have more leeway in what they're able yep. to agree to. And so that's part of the reason why they're able to kind of say yes to the Dieppe raid and, and move ahead with it. Um, I think that may be overblown slightly in the literature. I okay. think there's certainly, you know, I think the Canadian government is certainly very wary of how they deploy their troops. And, you know, King doesn't really even want a large army, whereas the army wants a large army and so on and so forth. Um, but the British were also fairly keen to, they were wary of the involvement of Canadians in other theaters too, right? Uh, there were political yeah. reasons for this. For instance, North Africa, they didn't yeah. want to be seen as, you know, bringing another Commonwealth nation in, 
to mm-hmm. fight this. And then it becomes like, oh, it's, you know, we're, yeah. we're just sacrificing the colonials, you know, for, yeah. you know, British interests. You have one active, in, in, have one active theater so, and it's all colonials. That doesn't look good. So it's, yeah. yeah. So that, so there was, there was reasons on kind of both sides as to why the Canadians didn't necessarily get involved um, as early on. Yeah. And, you know, M- M- McNaughton has in particular been, been maligned for not kind of, approving more operations you know sooner hmm. but his, his idea i think one was yeah he wanted to keep the army as intact as he could for the return yep. um you know to victory and everything but the other was there just weren't a lot of options right they're just the yeah. parade was an option yeah. that was you know that you know the, the spitzbergen you know kind of raid but there was no enemy there so you know that happened but there's very you know there's a whole bunch of ideas maybe to go into norway again and stuff but those all get rejected both by mcnaughton and by the british chiefs of staff because it's luckily just, yeah exactly so <laughs> would have been disasters. that's the thing is there's really a short of shortage of opportunities to deploy the canadian army yeah the, i think in, that's that's a good in, point i don't really much yeah. to add other than yeah i think it's it, it's important to remember and this is kind of I think digging a little deeper than may and uh, no way faulting that a museum can do, but understanding that the players that you already mentioned, like Kriar is pushing for, you know, the yeah. big R well, and that's, as it's called. And that's it's part of the it. pressure. That's part of the yeah. pressure that Kriar kind of sees as well is, you know, the Royal Canadian air force is certainly active. They've been active technically yeah. since like the first day of the war, yep. same with the Royal Canadian Navy. They're the ones getting all the headlines, right? They're the ones, you know. Yeah, career was not happy about. Want to talk about propaganda? There's, you know, Canadians winning DFCs and, you know, yeah. U-boat clashes at sea I mean, and everything. But the army's sitting in England. I've literally seen the, the letters that Creer wrote to people because he was, you know, he was the chief of the general staff before all of this. He, he was not happy. <laughs> he was very un. On, very upset that the Canadians were not fighting. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, and that's just a bit of a digger deep, a deep, a deeper dive on this. But I, I think it is it bears to understand. And as both of us are historians, we can't stop uh, understanding these things and, and these individuals, right? Especially Criar. I mean, I don't. I have a very mixed opinion on Criar. I'm like, I'm not going to yeah. boo him like I did to certain somebody yeah. else. But <laughs> it's just it's 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 complicated, and there's lots of factors going beyond that are often just forgotten. Uh, anyway, we'll keep going um, with the with the force commanders. I think is a good place to move to. Yeah, next. so right. you got three four. This is this has changed, right? Like the force commanders have changed, especially the naval yep. force commander. There was supposed to be, I think Bailey Gorman was his name, a, a British so. admiral who was supposed to be in command. Uh, he was in command, I believe, for originally for Rudder, and then when it you know he was shifted out, and then uh, Captain John Hughes Hallett, who was one of um, one of Mountbatten's staff officers, essentially, who yep. helped plan the raid, was put in as the naval force commander. Quite a, quite a low low rank. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Uh, uh, okay. Shell J six. Uh, you know, R- Russia's yep. invaded, and, and and there's plenty of pressure coming from um, the left part of politics to get the especially, allies involved yeah. in some way. Uh, you know, it, in, it was in, one of those. Uh, yeah, especially after Barbarossa begins, it was one of those yeah. things, events that have you know that have brings together the political divide. The, the, you know, the second the, front the, now movement. Yeah, well, because the yeah, the, even the hardcore left people were like, we have to support the Soviet Union. But even before all of that, the people in the Conservative Party, particularly, were pushing so hard, and there was a yeah. lot of popular reception. Again, sorry, this was all part of my dissertation, so I can't stop yeah, myself talking about it. But it was all part of that. The people really did want Canadians to fight. It, yeah. it was something that. It can't be just dismissed because there's tons of evidence for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Air Force commander, I'm going from right to left for some reason, but anyway, the Air Force <laughs> commander was Air Vice Marshal Trafford Lee Mallory, a uh, fairly controversial figure during the Battle of Britain. He was the guy who wanted to work with uh, Douglas Bader on the big wings. Uh, he yeah. commanded 12 group, I think it was, which wasn't in the in the bulk of the fight for the Battle of Britain. Uh, after the Battle of Britain, he takes over number 11 group, part of Fighter Command, which is, um, you know, covers the Channel Coast in the in the sector uh, where kind of across the, the channel from where the Dieppe raid is going to take place. So he's in charge of, of the air uh, force for this operation. And then we have uh, Major General, uh, we don't like uh, Lee Mallory, do I knew that was coming. <laughs> I think he did okay on this in on this occasion, but any, oh, okay, anyway. oh, we're not um, going further into that one. <laughs> anyway, um, I think the Air Force did okay, and we'll talk about that anyway. We can talk about that. But uh, and then you have Major General John Hamilton Roberts, um, who was you know a veteran like like many of these guys. You know, I know Lee Mallory, I believe, was as well a veteran of the First World War, uh, who yep. won the Military Cross, and uh, he was the commander of the Second Canadian Infantry Division uh, for the Dieppe raid, uh, and, and it was his you know. 
the planning is interesting because like his staff got you know some say in what was going on but but largely yep. the plan was already in place before they got there mm-hmm. um you know certainly his uh his chief staff officer churchill man uh did a lot of the uh the work on the planning sorry. uh okay <laughs> <laughs> might be fair. Fair. sorry fair. i told you um, i told you that was gonna come and, and so these are these are these you know at the end of the day the only people who can these are the only people who can really influence what's going on yeah. uh you know, on the day. And honestly, they don't really have all that much influence themselves once things start. Um, You know, uh, uh, Hamilton Roberts has kind of one card to play and he plays it and it turns out to be the wrong one. Um, Air air power, you know, we'll talk about that in a second. And um, ultimately Hughes Hallett and Roberts, you know, make the decision to joint decision together to withdraw. And we'll talk about that in a second as well. So uh, next slide, please. (laughs) So just a little note from Lee Mallory, uh, kind of your standard, you know, about to go off and fight the Huns uh, yeah. type type gesture. Um, and I think he used this note both, you know, originally for Operation Rudder and then for Jubilee, but basically, you know, trying to pump up the troops and, and, and you know, boost everybody's morale uh, beforehand. Certainly things did not go the way they had hoped. And I think you can, by reading that, see what I'm talking about. Um, you can go, go on to the next slide there. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Sorry, just a quick one, but I, I do think yeah. it's literally the same letter. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's it's a cover page for the, for the literally plan. the exact. Same. <laughs> it was literally the same, which is interesting <laughs> and very symbolic. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time on the context here, and I haven't even covered half of it. But some just wanted to sum up. Here are the reasons posited for the Dieppe raid. I'm not in any way saying one of these yeah. is more important than the others um, or anything like that. But here are some of the reasons. So, one, appeasing Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, um, get you know pr- get the Germans to reinforce their coastal defenses at the expense of the Eastern Front. Pressure from the Americans for a second front in 1942. I've talked about Lord Lewis Mountbatten and perhaps empire building. There's a question around whether the action was, was authorized or not, um, especially you know because Rudder was certainly authorized, but was Jubilee. Yeah. Mountbatten maintained, you know, forever that basically there was no written decision uh, at the chiefs of staff because they yep. wanted to keep it secret. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing that really, um, there's nothing that really, there's no evidence one way or another on that. You know, we kind of have to, to some degree, yeah. take his word for it. But there is evidence in the sense that, you know, Churchill is asking about the status of Operation Jubilee and if it's going to happen right before it happens. So. Right. Obviously, they, they they knew something was going on, and they knew you know there was an operation likely to to, to go down. So that that tends mm-hmm. to support Mount Batten's side of it. Um, so it probably was an authorized action, technically, um, just a bit of a not in the typical way it would have been authorized, I suppose. Right. But certainly, it was part of kind of his empire building and trying to position himself as kind of a major commander for you know eventually Overlord. Mm-hmm. Um, Testing enemy defenses and combined operation techniques, including the capture of a port, you know, D-Day rehearsal, that's ob- obviously been put out there by, by many people, including veterans in particular uh, of the raid. Raise allied mor- morale. I think every raid is a chance to do that. You know, obviously yeah. it's weird. This raid is weird, and we'll talk about the propaganda, but um, in terms of the uh, morale of Canadian troops, it's weirdly it went up after the raid. It did. Um, but it did. Uh, anyway, you know, every raid it has the possibility to be a propaganda raid if you, if it's carried out well and to do something for your war effort that way. Another reason, uh, draw out the Luftwaffe. Uh, basically, the uh, the British, uh, the Royal Air Force in particular, was, and the Americans, by the way, are just starting things up in terms of yeah. the uh, the 8th Air Force or, or their 8th Bomber Command, it was, it was called at the time. But the Luftwaffe could kind of fight on its own terms over France, um, and, and, and the Air Force has been trying to draw them out for in a couple, two years now, basically, with very limited success. And so they hoped a landing of this size would, would draw them out. It certainly did, uh, and it, it created a big air battle. Um, but, you know, whether or not that's really the – certainly that's probably, probably why the Air Force was happy to be involved, but I don't think it was mm-hmm. like, the main reason yeah. to do it. Yeah, I um, agree with that, yeah. And then intelligence gathering, as we've talked about, you know, the Enigma machines and, and code books and a pinch raid to support the naval war. And I've added an addendum to that, the Air War too. And we talked about the Wurzburg radar. There was also a Freya, a Freya station near Poorville uh, in, a, in a bunker complex uh, just between Poorville and the main beaches at Dieppe. 
and there was an idea that they could go and perhaps capture that, bring the equipment back, and do do a do a good ana analysis of it because the Freya worked together with the Wurzburg radar system, and so it was would have been good for the Allies to learn more about it. And and actually they didn't. I'll talk about that a little bit in a second as well. So now we can move to finally, I guess, Zone Two, the the raid itself. Uh, well, before oh, I do. Oh, yeah. I, I forget I put these because of, yeah. uh, because of the inauguration yesterday. We so I just I tried, tried to give you some <laughs> artifact examples. So these two gentlemen are from the Association of Cipher and Information Security Reservists over in France. And they have provided us with the, an Enigma 1 machine. Uh, uh, okay. Enigma 1 is a, is, a, is a usually a German army machine, uh, not a... Yeah, not not a naval uh, version, but it is similar and it works in a similar fashion uh, as the M3 and M4 Enigmas. Yeah. Um, obviously, the M3 and the M4s are much more complicated. Uh, one of the big ex big differences, the Enigma 1 is basically an M3, except the Enigma 1, um, instead of, um, I believe, instead of letters on the 26 contact points, there are numbers on the 26 contact points. Right. And another big difference is um, an Enigma 1 is not meant to go aboard a warship. Whereas a, a naval enigma is, and they have um, they have a, a special plug-in so that they can mm -hmm. uh, adapt to the higher voltage that's present aboard a warship, as opposed to in a headquarters or something like that. So it's great we have this only for a few months, uh, on, you know. Uh, but it was great to get a copy of an enigma machine to mm -hmm. put next to the naval intelligence war section to give people an idea of what we were talking about when we were talking about these cipher machines and, and how they operated. So that'll be, the, uh, I think that'll be an artifact that uh, draws some, uh, some eyeballs. <laughs> I think so. I think so. So we're really grateful to have it. That's for sure. Yeah. That's, 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 that's really cool to see. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, all right. Now back to the regular scheduled programming. That's, that's it. So, the raid itself. So what we'll do is we'll 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 talk a little bit about the uh, the, the the naval, the air, and the, the the military forces involved. So this is the fleet. You'll see two general numbers when you go out there and read about the Dieppe raid. Uh, I think the, the 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 often cited number is maybe two thirty seven. Uh, the reason for that is yeah. because they don't include the minesweepers. Um, the right. minesweepers didn't kind of completely cross the channel, I think, and they didn't necessarily, mm. you know anchor off the Dieppe coast or anything or like that. Uh, but they were present as part of the naval force and played a significant role in getting the force there safely, which, you know, occurred, you know, fairly well, uh, except for the convoy battle that happened on the uh, Eastern flank. Um, yeah. But that wasn't nothing to do with mine speakers. Yeah. You can, you can see, you can see the fleet. Uh, you know, it's just nine landing ship infantry uh, vessels to carry, you know, most of the, um, uh, the Canadians in particular, but the, the, the main beach troops and the, and the, and the Canadian beach troops, You've got just eight destroyers, you know, and, and again, these destroyers are probably pressed pretty thin, right? Because there's only eight of them. They both have to provide escort against, you know, whatever German vessels show up or submarines if they show up. They also have to, you know, they're providing the, you know, four-inch guns that are supposed to bombard the enemy defenses and everything like that. So really tough role uh, for, for, for them. They're very split on what they need to do. Um, you've got a sloop. Uh, you've got a river gunboat, and the river gunboat is actually... Uh, the HMS Locust, and it's uh, supposed mm -hmm. to carry the Royal Marine Commando into the harbor uh, to help them, uh, you know, get in and, uh, you know, pinch uh, the Enigma, uh, either machine or code books that are hopefully uh, there at the at the headquarters or on the trawlers that are based in the Dieppe Harbor. Um, you got the 16 minesweepers, like I said, uh, 39 coastal craft of various um, uh, shapes and sizes. A number of these were actually French, uh, free French. Mm -hmm. Um, and you had about 180, 179 landing craft um, crewed by combined operations, uh, mostly naval uh, and perhaps some yeah. marine personnel um, as well. Um, and so relatively small naval force, not not tiny, you know, it's a significant armada, but, you know, if we want to compare it to any of the other major amphibious operations in the <laughs> Second World War, it's yeah. pretty small and pretty limited in terms of the firepower it brings to bear, unfortunately, um, as will play out Um yeah, thanks, Sam. Yeah, we were really, really happy yeah, to be able great. to provide this infographic. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing, uh, especially because yeah, I just want to jump in. I think it's it, it's I don't know, maybe it's because of my own bias, my own academic background, but sometimes I have trouble like visualizing what means, you know. And I think this is a great way uh, 
to do it because it helps you kind of get a sense of some scale, but also you know, yeah. number, which I think is great to see. Yeah. Yeah. And some great of those, stuff. some of those landing craft, the landing craft are those are kind of landing craft M's or yeah, something. They're like that small. <laughs> yeah, they're not that small. Some of them are landing craft tanks, uh, Tank. which yeah. are a bit bigger, right? So, but yeah. we had to choose one to, for that. And most of yeah, the landing yeah. craft were smaller. So there you it go. It was mostly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The assault. Yeah. Anyway, do you want to keep going? Yeah, we'll keep going. Get to the Air Force stuff, which is where I'm really keen. Uh, obviously, you don't, don't say. Huh? Yeah, I wonder why that is. <laughs> so I just, Force, I'm just teasing. I'm just no, teasing. no, it's, the Air Force uh, had a very significant contribution to the Dieppe raid. Um, about 1,200 aircraft that the the Wait, Allies. Can I stop you real quick, there, yeah. Alex? If that's yeah. okay. I just want to yeah. go back because uh, we just have a good question. Um, oh, okay. Uh, from Sheldrake. Uh, oh, that is a good bizarre. Question. Yeah. How does that come compare? That's a good question. I think it's I think it's probably significantly bigger. I don't I really know. Okay. Um, but I because I I because I, I, most of those like I don't think they had. Uh, I, I don't want to comment on that because I just don't know. But okay. I think it was. I just I know about the blocking vessels, but that's something else entirely. I mean, it's um, I think it's the, the the number of troops involved are more in the hundreds as opposed to the thousands, right? So yeah, as far uh, as I know. Yeah. Yeah. So I think anyway, and okay. a lot of them yeah. are delivered aboard destroyers and smaller coastal craft than. Um, and everything like yeah. that. So. A bunch of Canadians here. We 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 don't know. <laughs> Sorry, Dave. It's not our. It's not our. Uh, it's not our thing. We're not supposed to say the name. I know. <laughs> <laughs> He's been outed many times. He's even been on the channel. <laughs> it's on him now. Uh, anyway, back to your favorite. Yeah. So the Allied Air Forces. Um, a big deal is made about the air battle. It's it's, it's it was at yep. the time the the, great, the largest air single day air battle um, that had ever taken place, at least on certainly on the Western Front. Um, uh, and a lot of people point, and, and part of the reason for that is it, the 106 aircraft the Royal Air Force um, lost that day, yep. um, or the Allied Air Forces lost that day, was higher than any other day any day during the Battle of Britain. Higher single day loss than any other day. Now, what I will say about that is one, most of them were fighter aircraft. There were very few bombers that the Allies lost during the Dieppe raid. Um, so mostly, you know, Spitfires, uh, you know, Hawker Hurricanes, uh, especially the North American Mustangs, they lost a lot of those because they were, I'll kind of run through this and actually indicate, you know, what their yeah. jobs all were. So yeah, sure. lots of spit, lot of Spitfires, right? Spitfire 5s and a few Spitfire 9s, uh, which were the better, newer sure. model. Their job was mostly air superiority, you know, combat patrols to make sure the German uh, Air Force stayed away. Some of them were on strafing duties as well and that sort of thing. But most of that strafing duty was done uh, by Hawker Hurricanes, some of which also dropped bombs and smoke um, in advance and during the course of the raid. Uh, so the, the Hurricanes were mostly the fighter bombers at this point. Hawker Typhoons, this is very early in the war. So they are actually um, interceptors, low-level interceptors. And they actually send these guys out to try to do some um, diversions to get the Germans to kind of react. It doesn't doesn't seem to really work all that well, um, yeah. but uh, they're there as well. The Mustang's job, kind of just like in Normandy uh, for the Canadian Air Force, was to be reconnaissance aircraft. So they were supposed to go right. kind of inland from Dieppe, check the roads, see if the Germans are reacting, sending up any reaction forces, you know, from Rouen or from Paris or anything like that, report back and then the bomber force would go over and attack them and that sort of thing. Yeah. And they're, they're operating in kind of twos and fours in small groups. And so they're often picked off either by flak because they're flying, you know, relatively lower pretty or they're getting picked off by enemy fighters. And so pretty significant casualties among the Mustang uh, uh, pilots and squadrons. Um, 66 uh, Douglas Boston's and 16 Bristol Blenheim's. Uh, their job was effectively to bombard the, um, the coastal gun defenses and uh, artillery batteries uh, just, you know, around the landing beaches and also to uh, drop smoke to try to kind of shield the landings from enemy fire. Um, mm -hmm. Pretty mixed results on that. And certainly um, perhaps they had some suppressive effect, the bombing, but I don't think they did much damage to the um, uh, the German um, artillery positions or anything like that. Right. And then the biggest um, aircraft uh, you have involved were the uh, 24 uh, B-17 Flying Fortresses. These were from the U.S. Army Air Force. And their job was to bomb a local airfield uh, to try to deny its use to the enemy during the raid, which, you know, um, they did successfully and returned home without any casualties. But whether or not it had a huge impact on the raid, yeah, maybe not so much. Um, so that's kind of a rundown of what the Allied Air Forces are trying to do. And then what? there's the one Bristol Bullfighter. Um, <laughs> I can't figure out why. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> 
there is a story about how this this bow fighter um it's very late in the day the the, the landing force is on its way home you know whoever got evacuated and everything like that yeah. i think they just sent up a bow fighter because um it was getting close to the night and it was a night fighter that went up True. to do a patrol yeah. okay. to prevent the german uh bombers from attacking the uh, retreating vessels or and something it's like that so, so technically odd. Technically, it's 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 it, it was involved, uh, but but very minorly. Yeah, it's just <laughs> anyway. so odd, right? Because it's just one outlier. It doesn't really like the rundown. The great rundown that you just gave it just doesn't fit. And then this one little guy by himself. Uh, anyway, it's just yes. yeah, that's great. It, it makes perfect sense though. If you, if, I, I, if, I also if, love I love bow fighters, so I um yeah, yeah they have their fan club, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> There's some love out there for the bow fighter still, which is it's an interesting fighter. All uh, it's an interesting. Uh, it's an interesting aircraft, and uh, we'll leave it at that. You so, want to keep going? Yeah, so 106 aircraft lost, 4% um, loss rate in terms of sorties. Um, sortie, one aircraft on one mission. So yeah. that was the loss rate. Not, 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 not a terrible loss rate, but not a, not a great loss rate either. But not if we great. want to go to the next slide, um, I make a point about this later with the Germans, and I'll get to that in a second. But yeah, I want to speak right. to the international representation among the Allied Air Forces mm. for this operation. So... About right. 43 British RAF squadrons. There were actually more American squadrons involved than Canadian, although three were Eagle squadrons, which were um, American squadrons right. still serving under RAF command. So American personnel yep. flying Spitfires in uh, in the Royal Air Force. Uh, mm -hmm. There were seven. The, there were three um, uh, U.S. Army Air Force Spitfire squadrons, and then the the, yeah. the B-17s. Right. There were four squadrons of B-17s because their squadrons are only six aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, the Canadians, you know, we had nine RCAF squadrons. Uh, most of those were Spitfires and Mustangs, although there were some uh, of the light, some of the uh, the Boston uh, bombers were, were were Canadian as well. You've got Poles, you've got Czechs, you've got Norwegians, you've got Free French, one squadron, Belgians, one squadron. The Spitfire on the bottom right, that is a Spitfire from uh, the Belgian squadron, uh, Flight Lieutenant okay. Ivan de Monceau de Bergendals Spitfire. Okay. You got New Zealand and. Uh, the Rhodesian squadron isn't really a Rhodesian squadron. It's a sponsored squadron. Um, so it's, you know, RAF and Commonwealth personnel, but, you know, they sponsor it. So I, I gave them some credit there. Uh, but just to give you an idea of the international nature of the force, you know, uh, it's kind of a precursor for D-Day. Like, you know, in a mm. sense, like international yeah. nature of the force. There's obviously a lot more American uh, air, air power on D-Day for sure. But it just gives yeah. you an idea of this growing coalition um, against uh, the Germans and and how they're you know <laughs> we'll fight a supremacy. <laughs> <against them. laughs> anyway, so on to on to the German Air Force uh, a little bit. Just I, I love talking about the um, the air battle mm -hmm. a little bit. So very relatively speaking, they didn't have very many aircraft in the area. You know, just over three hundred of them. Um, right. But they did fly not over nine hundred sorties, so an average of like yeah. three sorties per per plane, uh, basically. Yeah. Um, they lost 48 aircraft, and their loss rate based on sorties was 5%. So it was actually higher than the British loss rate, and significantly right. higher if it was to do it by you know aircraft loss versus aircraft available. Um, and right. about half of those losses, of those 48 losses, were bombers. And so right. they're losing a lot more air crew um, on a relative basis than than the than the, the Allies because they're not just losing kind of single pilot fighters in, in, in any cases. Uh, the Germans at this point do have the Focke Wolf 190 uh, fighter, mm -hmm. which is uh, fairly modern uh, and it outclasses most of the um, allied fighters. Uh, the Spitfire nines. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, we're outclassed by the F, you know, the, the Spitfire nines were better, um, but there weren't enough of them um, at this point. Not enough, so not even close mainly, to, yeah. mainly Spitfire fives. Um, and yeah. so, you know, that, that, that helps to explain some of the fighter losses for sure. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, in the total assessment of the air battle, I think the allies did fairly well. Um, they, they prevented the right, Germans, right. you know, they, they, they didn't quite achieve air superiority in the sense that we would think about on D-Day, but only right. one major warship, a destroyer was actually sunk by German bombs on the day. So, mm -hmm. you know, that is a fairly good result. Um, they probably, you know, the the, the 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 problem with the air force is, of course, they probably strafe their own troops a couple of times, and that that sort of thing tends to happen, unfortunately. Um, and they could they could not provide the, the the support that was really needed. Sometimes the smoke came in at, at good times and helped to shield the beaches beaches from German fire yep. and that sort of thing. But ultimately, they couldn't completely suppress the enemy guns, and there was a, a system for uh, close air support available. 
but right. it took it just took too long uh, to too get long. the message back to uh, Britain to get the aircraft to go over and bomb the target. By the time all that happened, typically the target, you know, things had changed. The situation had changed, yeah. and it took hours. Um, yeah, I just want to go back because uh, if that's all right, just to the uh, sorry, one second to the uh, international component because children. Yeah, they, they, they makes a good point, and they are very striking to yeah. see is the different plaques that are on the aquatic center on the well, on the beach. It's just off the you know sandy part. Uh, is is cool. It is cool to see because you get to to take all the different uh, things into consideration, all the different uh, nationalities that are involved, and and just kind of understanding the scope of this. And it, it it is it's and it's just right off the beach, so you easily can go see them. So it's, it it is very cool to see. Yeah, and I mean, even at even at sea too, and and you know, there were some free French yeah. commandos. We'll get into in a second. Like, there's a number of ways in which the international community is yeah. assisting with this with this operation. Yeah, that's just the the delay of the software <laughs> getting the comments after. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's great to see those. I think it's it's uh, important to remember, especially for Dieppe. Like as you said, there's other involvement here. It's not just Canadian only. So this is the, the ground component. And as you can see, it's primarily Canadians, you know, almost 5,000 Canadians. But there were 1,000 British uh, commandos, uh, both uh, Marine commandos and Army commandos. Yep. 50 U.S. Rangers sprinkled among uh, the various landing areas, as well as um, 15 Free French uh, uh, commandos as well. And there were actually five um, anti-Nazi enemy nationals of, num of a number three troop um, or X troop of number 10 inter-allied commando as well. So yep. uh, again, the international force is, is, is present here, and this is the first time that Americans are going to engage in ground combat mm -hmm. against the Germans in the Second World War. Yeah, which is, I think is is interesting uh, because a that's often forgotten because um, it's usually North Africa, right? Uh, that is thought of, uh, but and, and again for everything I've read, again I'm not, I'm not claiming to be like a DEP expert by any means, but that the, the American, the, well, they're Rangers, right? They're they're, they're Army Rangers hold do very well uh, and basically being dropped into another force and, and you know holding themselves well in a battle like this. It's it's again important to remember i'm just gonna keep saying it but the international component because yeah children just they've just made a good point it's always seen as the canadian battle and that's not necessarily the case yeah yeah anyway oh and uh dave is uh very uh, uh very much appreciative of, of the color <laughs> of the leaves green green not red that's right yes yes, yes. anyway do you want to keep going yeah yeah i'm gonna have to probably speed this up a little bit we're already at 56 uh, minutes so uh, we're at the we're at the rate so um, this is our big map. This is a great room. When you go into the exhibit at the back of the room, uh, which is zone two, you get to see this big wall map, which is in even better yeah. detail than this because it's this is a screen grab of it. But basically, we try with this map to kind of give people a visual of you know what was planned, you know what were the movements that were planned versus what actually happened. Um, right. And we have a little timeline of the events, you know, sitting below the map that helps to explain you know the what actually happened component. Um, I won't talk about this too much because I think most people who are listening in kind of know the yeah. have a general sense of what happened during the Dieppe raid. Yeah. Um, but obviously, you know, none of the landings went, you know, none of the Canadians landings went particularly well. Poorville perhaps better than the others. The landings on Orange Beach um, went fairly well. Uh, one of the few successes of the raid, they were able to um, destroy uh, the coastal gun battery there, mm -hmm. uh, preventing it from firing out to sea. At Yellow Beach, uh, on the eastern side of the map, uh, they weren't able to destroy the gun battery, but they were able to suppress it uh, a decent amount, um, and, and and that was very helpful. Again, uh, you know, Blue Beach, uh, just the worst of the beaches. You know, they hardly got off the beach, and those that did were in very small groups and could not really do anything. Do anything at all. Part of the problem with the plan was it was so important. Like surprise was and speed were so important. Yeah. And yet the two flank beaches, the blue blue beach and green beach, uh, they went in, I think it was 10 minutes before the main beach. Yeah. And the problem was, is once they had, I mean, if, I mean, the blue beach, they landed late uh, anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. but the, the whole plan kind of starts to fall apart even before it happens. Because if you're so reliant on surprise, then how are you supposed to have surprise if some landings have gone in before others? I mean, the idea right. is green beach and blue beach, land they get up onto the cliffs and they take those coastal defenses out uh, so that they can't fire down on the main beaches 
but ultimately they can't get there and it just turns into carnage, unfortunately. And yeah, there's a whole set of circumstances that lead to, like you said, the delays and all of that stuff. Um, but again, like, I think that story is pretty well known. There's lots of other places. You yeah. Yeah. So, out. And this, well, and, and we got a question about the map if, if that's right. yeah asking who who made it it's it's who great. did the graphic um so uh, i advised uh, but we have a great um designer out in france um so who did uh, his name is uh, Frederic uh, Turgis, and he's been a longtime collaborator with the Juno Beach Center, and he wow. drew you know all the maps and and did everything you know we based this map off of a number of other maps uh from various books and and sources um, and, you know, he did a really great job with all the infographics and the infographics are really in there for the people who are really keen and really want to see this map less so because this map is such a big presence in the room. But most of the infographics yeah. are there for the, the, the history buffs and the real keen people to want to kind of get the data, get the numbers and better understand things. And so yeah. really excited to have kind of that component of content kind of aimed at one audience, whereas there's other stories and other content right. that maybe less knowledgeable audiences as well. Yeah. And and I think this is uh, oh that's the wrong one sorry sorry Sam not you yet um, <laughs> she popped up on me there for this audience is a good idea <laughs> well <laughs> maybe, that's uh, I don't know yeah wow, that's a that's a good idea that's yeah, a really good idea I mean in general I one, one of the things I'd love to do with this exhibition yeah. is you know kind of copy what the Canadian War Museum does and like do a little booklet or something yeah that'd with be all of our idea. infographics and using our reusing our text Absolutely. and stuff and maybe that's something we can do after the exhibit is. Uh, yeah. Oh, has has run its course, yeah. Well, I I want a copy of this map now for my wall. <laughs> so yeah, please make paper ones because it's all right, it's, all it's right, great. That's it's a really you know what, well, you know that's that's a good point. Hey, we're 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 here to help. <laughs> uh, oh, and then sorry, yeah, yeah, it's a good, another good idea. Um, about yeah, maybe, I don't know. If anyway. I don't know if we're going to do the remembrance run this year. We'll see. We're not sure yet. We'll, we'll see. see how things. Yeah. Go. Again, we can't can't say if things are going to happen in this in this timeline with everything happening. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we should probably get going because again, this is a great map. Yeah. It, again, when it's done, like you were describing it to me when we talked a couple weeks back, like it's just going to be it's going to be a presence. I guess is the best way to say it in, in a good way. So, just a quick note about the tanks. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I wanted a little bit more on this infographic, oh. the the number of tanks. And like the, <laughs> I had I have literally in front of me Calgary Regiment strength landed from LCTs, drowned, made it to shore, crossed the yeah. seawall, returned to beach, never got off the beach, so on. Um, the main point I, I want to make about the tanks is we all know I think most of us are aware of the situation in terms of the yeah. the chert, uh, pebble stones on the beach and yep. what they could do to tracks of tanks. Mm -hmm. Good research suggests that maybe that's a little bit exaggerated, the number of tanks that were actually immobilized by those. There were other yep. reasons tanks were immobilized. You know, the Churchills were very well armored, and so the German anti-tank guns often didn't penetrate their armor, but they could damage the tracks. And if they exactly. lost the tracks, they're yeah. not going very far. Um, about maybe as many as seven of the um, 29 tanks that were landed from LCTs and 27 actually landed, uh, mm -hmm. made landfall only about seven of them were probably stuck on the beach by chert before leaving the beach in the first okay. place many right. of the tanks actually did manage to get to the promenade and over the seawall yep. which they did have they did have specialized engineering equipment to help them do that yep. um, the problem was the town of dieppe if you look at it on google maps or if you go there there's only so many exits from the beach into the city mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the Germans had blocked all these with like concrete and other obstacles and so and rubble and stuff like that. So the tanks would get up to the promenade. They couldn't go anywhere. And the, the thing that yeah, was supposed to help them was the engineers. The engineers were supposed to blow holes in, in those um, uh, in, to make gaps. But unfortunately, yeah. the tanks had landed late. Many of the engineers had been killed or wounded on mm -hmm. the beach before the tanks even got there or during the course of the, the, the early fighting. And therefore, the tanks were stuck and couldn't go anywhere. So, like this picture in the middle at the end, uh, at the end of the battle, it shows a lot of the tanks sitting there sideways on the beach. Part yeah. of the reason they're sitting sideways is they've actually returned to the beach in many yeah. cases and parked themselves sideways to provide extra cover for the infantry. 
Yeah. And then the crews are just firing off all their ammunition at anything they can, but eventually they run out of ammunition and can't can't do very much. Um, yeah, yeah, they basically turn themselves into pillboxes. Yeah, ex ex yeah, exactly. And so it's a bit more of a complicated situation than is often kind of, yep. you know, discussed. Um, and it really, you know, that may be one of the areas in which, you know, they did learn lessons in terms of like, let's have armored engineer vehicles that right. have like or, you know, huge mortars in them that can blow those gaps for our tanks, right? Yeah. So, you know, maybe there's, th that's one example of where, you know, D-Day was assisted by Dieppe, right? Um, yeah. But uh, that's the, you know, there's more to be said about the tanks, but. Um, yeah, and I think something on. like this in the museum will help in that sense. Like I said, if someone's really interested in that, they'll see this, they'll be drawn in by the pictures of the tanks and then hopefully that lesson can come through. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we should, uh, we should keep moving here. Yeah, this is an important one. Yeah. yeah, so we've got this infographic of casualties, and this was just an incredibly deadly day uh, for the Canadian Army. And the Canadian casualties are at the top, and then the bottom, you see uh, casualties, all nationalities, land, sea, and air forces. And the Canadians took up, you know, three quarters of the casualties, basically. Um, there's about, a, you know, a thousand other um, uh, non-Canadian casualties on the raid, but the Canadians in terms of killed in action were far and above in the majority, you know, 90% or more, uh, or 80% yeah. you know, or more, um, you know, very, very deadly operation. Um, lots of prisoners of war as well. Um, and, and we'll break that down in a second. Uh, but you know, this is, you know, the worst day of the, of, of the war for the Canadian army, um, uh, by far, yeah. <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, the force was just you know decimated almost in in certain in certain cases uh you know some of the beaches yeah. casualties were in excess of you know 90 percent uh, in terms of the units involved uh, not killed necessarily but you know killed yeah casualties yeah 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 it's gonna be a, another striking infographic for the exhibit a couple of artifact examples from this zone so we actually have a rolls royce merlin engine which was used by the hurricanes and spitfires um cool. <laughs> uh, that were part of the raid and then the other one is uh, quite interesting. It's a pigeon message copy that was kept by Lieutenant Colonel John Macbeth. Uh, he was in charge of 2nd Canadian Division signals during the raid. And um, this was the message that Major General Roberts sent out to General Crear uh, back at um, number 11 group headquarters because uh, Crear was with uh, yep. Lee Mallory. Basically, very heavy casualties in men and ships, uh, did everything possible to get men off. But in order to get any uh, home, had to come to sad decision to abandon remainder. This was joint decision by force commanders. Obviously, operation completely lacked surprise. So that's, uh, you know, at 1340 hours, that's uh, General Roberts's kind of first kind of indication, uh, you know, to uh, just how bad things have gone uh, yeah. back to his superiors uh, back in England. And it's quite a, quite a great piece. The Canadian War Museum uh, provided us with a facsimile of yeah. it. Um, and so it's a really beautifully uh, done um, a copy, uh, and that helps to tell the story of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Macbeth, um, uh, who uh, who's we have some artifacts of his uh, in, oh, in the exhibit as well. Yeah, uh, I just want to go back real quick. Um, sorry, what are you doing here? Uh, about the tanks again. Uh, I can't, I'm not sure. I don't. I can't remember. I'm, I'm having trouble remembering this. But the tanks themselves and, and the training exercises. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so, but I do Neither. think again they there there was some thought given to the, the the stones and what would happen. I think yeah. before the raid, and they did provide them with like uh, some of the kind of kind of fascines and like the, the the skirts that could be rolled out in front of the vehicles, um, so that so that they could yeah, get right. one over the seawall. And you know, it was especially the seawall. I think they were mostly worried about. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I, you know, certainly they perhaps could have done more, uh, more testing. But I, I, I don't know enough about it to be honest. Yeah, well, that just that just made me think of something like how you're talking about how the well, the sound ones, right? That's what we're talking about. I have one actually. I've got one right here. Um, yeah, this is one of the yeah. bigger ones. I may or may not, have, but there's millions on that beach, so uh, it's fine. Uh, but like talking about like what they can do to a tank, but you're saying to the treads, sorry, that that may be a little overblown, and I think that makes sense if you're thinking about it going back to the training, right? They're not too worried about the stones. They're more worried about the seawall and the things that they provide and the things that they were thinking before. So to me, that makes sense, right? And why that would be the case. So I, uh, but again, we don't know for sure, but, uh, and uh, yeah, they really did want to use the, uh, the Churchill's for the first time in combat. That was part of it. 
as well because I'm being asked about designs. But uh, uh, anyway, uh, we'll uh, we'll keep moving. So zone three propaganda. So we have kind of three major sections to zone three, which is access propaganda, allied propaganda, and then the reaction or the experience of families waiting for news at home. And that's kind of related to allied propaganda in particular. Um, so both sides use propaganda as a weapon uh, during uh, after the raid, as a result of the raid. Uh, some examples from the access side, I have two on the screen. One is uh, the poster on the left. So this is a French poster, a Vichy French poster. Um, and it shows, it kind of illustrates how the Dieppe Wa, the local uh, Dieppe civilians, were used by Vichy and the German uh, governments uh, for propaganda to show that the French actually supported Germany. Um, basically, um, 1,500 French POWs were returned to Dieppe. These were Dieppe POWs from the French army who were captured in 1940, who had still been in Germany, you know, doing labor and that sort of thing. Um, they had been, you know, 1,500 from Dieppe were returned to Dieppe uh, in September of 1942 in a way to thank the city for taking the German side in the raid. And basically the Dieppe mayor had arranged for this. Um, he was originally offered a monetary reward for the city, but instead asked for their prisoners of war back. The French POWs were actually very ashamed of this later on. Yeah. Because like basically they looked at it as like so many Canadians had died for their release. And so they were they were quite ashamed about it. On the right-hand side, we have a propaganda poster. This is a German propaganda poster, but it's in, I believe, Lithuanian, and it's from Lithuania. And um, this is kind of, you have to put yourself for Germany in the mindset of what is important for Germany in 1942. Well, it's the Eastern Front, and yeah. Lithuania is you know, part of the Eastern Front. And so this is a poster that's speaking to you know, firstly, it shows you kind of all the images that they've taken of, you know, Canadian and yeah. Allied prisoners of war and the, the carnage, you know, after the beach to show, you know, the second front is just, it's kaput before it's even started, right? And um, mm. literally the, the poster reads in the white text and the red text, the second front and its end, Dieppe. And so it's very much trying to impose on this idea, not just on German citizens, but also on, you know, people in their subjugated, you know, occupied territories, like right. the second front is over. It didn't work, folks. And, you know, that makes us, you know, for Germans, it makes them feel secure in that the main efforts, the Eastern Front, that's what we need to focus on. We've already dealt with the British over here. You know, don't need to worry about that anymore. It's just the Eastern Front we need to focus on. So, again, this idea of things are going well in the war and we can we can stand against any, you know, allied incursion in the West. So very important uh, pieces of the of the puzzle. Um, allied propaganda, if we can move to the Sorry, next slide. Sorry, just like this little, yeah. this little oh, yeah. here. Clearly Churchill Stalin. bowing to Stalin. Exactly. Like this idea that Dieppe shows that Churchill is subservient, you know, to Stalin. And he's just, you know, yeah. given him this as a, as a sop to, you know, because Stalin's his real master, right? So really, really good pickup there for sure. Yeah, and trying to, yeah, appeal to the, the Lithuanians who had just been, you know, forcibly annexed <laughs> like a couple yeah. years before. Exactly. Anyway, we'll keep going. So Allied propaganda also tried to weaponize the raid. And this is a very interesting subject because like the, the Allies knew the raid was going to happen. Uh, the Germans did not. Um, I mean, they knew raiding was happening, but they didn't know this particular raid was going to happen. Um, and uh, so the Allies had prepared a plan of what they were going to do in terms of their PR. And so Canadian historian Timothy Balzer talks about how a close look at the communication strategy of Combined Operation Headquarters concludes that overall, the story fed to the newspapers had been written in advance regardless of the raid's outcome. And there were basically two plans that Combined Operation Headquarters built. One was if it was a success, and it was, you know, obviously, you know, big propaganda success, great, you know, focus on heroism as well and, and focus on the success. Right. If the raid failed or if the raid was, you know, heavy casualties, whatever, the idea was to continue to focus on the heroism of the raid, but right. also to focus on the lessons learned aspect mm, of yeah, the raid yeah. as opposed to the objectives achieved because if it was a propaganda success, if it was success, we'd talk about all the all the objectives we achieved, right? But since right. we didn't achieve any objectives, the idea is, no, we're going to talk about the lessons learned, right? And so this is perhaps the start of that lessons learned element of why was the Dieppe parade put on? You know, is it a propaganda exercise? Yes. Is it, a, is it an exercise in a rehearsal for D-Day? Maybe, but certainly they wanted people to think it was. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. 
the line that Mountbatten kind of kept until his dying days is that, you know, we saved lives at, you know, on D-Day uh, because of, because of what happened at Dieppe. Um, and then, you know, Ross Monroe, Canadian war correspondent, you can see what he wrote um, after the raid. You know, Dieppe was a disaster and a triumph. It was a defeat and a conquest. It was tragic. It had brought forth such shining gallantry from 5,000 Canadians new to battle that their courage and audacity electrified the world's free people. Dieppe became a watchword for gallant conduct on every allied front. And so again, this idea of like heroism is what we're going to lead with uh, in the event of failure. And that is what ultimately kind of complicated the way the families and the loved ones responded to what had happened. Because originally, I mean, firstly, they accidentally kind of, uh, they made the mistake of actually initiating the success plan first. And then they had to kind of backtrack and shift to the failure plan. Right, and right. That, yeah. that, that, was a, that was a difficult communications thing for people who, you know, were trying to understand what had happened to their loved ones and everything like that. And so if you go mm. to the next slide, we have some examples of that. Yeah. Um, where, you know, firstly, on the right-hand side, you have a huge list of Canadian Army casualties coming out in September of 1942. You know, huge, you know, dozens and dozens of pages long. And you've got this cartoon here, you know, my taxes are awful and wages are too low. There's no profit anymore and gas and tires. But in the background is the sacrifice at Dieppe. And it's like those sacrifices are a pittance considered compared to what the men on the beaches of Dieppe you know went through right and so that's again you know we're trying to support the war effort with this event um in the families yeah. wait for news section you've got a, an image here this is an image of uh, canadian and british commandos canadian troops and british commandos after the raid who've returned to england and mary mclean um her son was lance corporal robert mclean and he died at blue beach and again you had to wait for news right did they yep. make it back to England and could therefore write a telegram? Were they captured? You know, did they um, make it to a prisoner of war camp in Germany and then they could write? Um, you know, if they died, you know, how long did it take to, to confirm that they were dead and to, you know, list them right. in, the, in the role of casualties? So people are, you know, desperate for information. And she is convinced that she sees her son in this photograph. And so she writes a scathing letter um, to the Department of National Defense in Canada, basically saying, like, how could you publish this? You know, why are pa newspapers allowed to capitalize on our sorrow and, you know, loss of a dear son? I'll never forget it. So, so that's part of the exhibition as well, is getting, you know, that experience out there. Of, you know, there's so much loss. And if you go to the next slide, actually, I think this is one of the infographics that displays this really well. Oh, right, yeah. This is this is just the infantry and armor units. It's not obviously like the core, the the, the core type units, like the signals or the the engineers or anything yeah, like that. Right, right, right. But it's you know, it just gives you a sense of where the losses were suffered from across the country, right? And so we've yeah. grouped, you know, Toronto, Ontario is 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 the the, the Royal Regiment. Of Royal Canada. Regiment, yeah, Riley's, uh, Riley's, Essex Scottish. Essex Scottish. Uh, FMR in the Black Watch a little bit, um, yeah. the Queen's Own Camerons, uh, yeah. the South Saskatchewan yeah. Regiment, and then the Calgary Regiment, and and yeah. just the the scale of loss for one day was absolutely huge for you know a country that was a fourth of the size in terms of population yeah. that we are today, yeah. um, and just across the country, you know, especially Southern Ontario, but also in Quebec and also in the Prairie Provinces where where these losses were being felt. Um, and in other places across the country as well. well um, and, I, and I've heard this from, and this isn't just me, but I, I guess I have to make my, my own Hong Kong comparison, but I've heard this from others uh, who went through it, is, well, A, Winnipeg had both, right? Because the Winnipeg yep. Grenadiers yeah. are near 100% casualties in that in that definition. But also in Quebec as well, Eastern Townships had two units. I mean, the Fusiliers had a good chunk from the Eastern Townships. But then again, so are the Royal Rifles. So it was like these twin disasters hitting these same places within what eight mm -hmm. months. It's it's staggering to, yeah. to what that did to these communities. Yeah, Ab -ab absolutely. Yeah. So we'll move uh, into we'll move into Zone Four, the captivity here. After I talk about this um, again, the Canadian yeah. Army and the, the war correspondents they actually would bring back people from, you know, who survived the Dieppe raid to do talks and to do like war bond tours and that sort of thing. And yeah. Ross Monroe, the, the war correspondent, did a tour very shortly after the Dieppe raid to the various towns and cities, you know, that we just talked about on the last slide. And so here's a lovely 
uh, kind of panoramic view of him addressing uh, people in uh, in near Windsor, Windsor uh, yeah. Ontario, uh, to tell them about what had happened. Uh, you know, from his perspective, and he was on a landing craft. I don't think he ever got off the landing craft that was near and so. around the beach. Um, and so he, but he would talk up the bravery in particular of of the men. He, you know, would say things like, you know, once you know the the, the decorations, you know, lists come out, you'll see how much bravery there was. Right. On the beach that day, once again, kind of, you can understand why he's doing this, because, you know, war correspondents are very willing to, you know, support the war effort in this way, but it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's essentially combined operations is, you know, planned for PR. It's like, it's a PR plan, yeah. right? It's part of the PR thing. So, well, and here's another example from, from Dave from earlier. Yeah. You mentioned and it's just a exactly. Example. I was waiting for this one. Yeah, yeah. He goes back to Quebec and 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 talks yep. about that. You know his experience there. Um, there's yep. lots of you know Monroe goes to um, goes to Hamilton as well. And there's mm, the rumors of you know Pod, Padre X rumors start cropping up. Yeah. That's you know right. Padre Foot right and what he did and everything like that. So um, you know people are desperate for pieces of news and of course the war correspondent can't always give people the individual news about their sons and daughters neither can yeah. even like lieutenant colonel menard but they can provide mm -hmm. little pieces or you know some of the officers or men that come back as wounded or who are exchanged as prisoners of war yeah they come back and start telling some of these stories but whether or not they tell the whole story right because they, they want to protect people oh, from yeah. the grief and you know the yep. reality of what happened right so reams of names and protecting absolutely. those still are yeah, and yeah. sorry, and protecting those still in German captivity. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And whole, yeah. like, you know, um, people are, you know, sending, you know, Red Cross parcels overseas to, to get yes. to their loved ones there. They're corresponding with them in the years after the Dieppe raid. Um, you know, and, and that news from home is just yep. so very important to those, you know, prisoners of war to kind of have that connection to home while they, yep. you know, oh, yeah, try to time. survive in, in those camps. Yeah. Yeah, it's so that big, takes big, us big, to the captivity. Yeah. And and again, this is the thing is, you know, the ordeal for many of the Canadians at Dieppe only started that day, right? The, the ordeal didn't finish until almost three years later when yeah. you know, they were liberated in kind of April, May 1945. Um, yeah. You know, 1,946 Canadians captured. I can't think of another instance where that many Canadians would have been captured on a single day. Like that's yeah. the worst, you know, surrender of Canadian troops, I think, in history. And hopefully it stays that way. Um, 72 Canadians died as prisoners of war, either as a result of wounds suffered um, during the raid, as a result of illness, the death marches of the winter and spring of 1945, or in some cases, there were executions as the result of sca escape attempts. Um, there's, for instance, a Royal Canadian engineer named Lieutenant uh, Miller. Um, he is He tries to escape unsuccessfully, it turns out. Uh, four times, and on the fourth attempt, uh, they took him to a, a concentration camp in Austria and just murdered him because mm -hmm. they had had enough, I suppose, of his escaping. Um, and, and there's also those who died um, during their escape attempts, too. Uh, there's some right. pretty gruesome stories yeah. of, you know, people, because some of the men would jump from their trains, like on the way to Germany, yeah. um, and they would be killed, you know, because, you know, they would jump and it would happen awkwardly and they would actually there was one instance of this where he ended up under the train and was yeah. killed that way um and there's a couple of interesting spots across europe where the prisoners of war and canadians are buried there's a lot of canadians mm -hmm. buried in dutch and belgian cemeteries because their bodies floated down on the english yeah. channel and everything but there's also some there's actually one guy at least i remember who was buried um at grosbeek in the netherlands because yes. he was killed on his way trying to escape. And so he's he's in turn there. There's some in Berlin, I believe, and a number in yeah. Poland as well. Um, yeah, exactly. Killed, that's that's his name. Yeah, one of Poulton's uh, friends, I think. Uh, yeah, I think how so. We, we know about that story, yeah. um, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah. <laughs> I think it's included in the in the book that he wrote about it. Uh, yeah. anyway, so so it's it's just the start of it's just the start of the story, right? And that's the important point that we try yeah. to make in this in this ex exhibit. And this is a, a map of kind of to give you an idea of where they were and, and yeah. after Dieppe, right? You know, they were cared for at three major kind of hospital areas. One was in Dieppe proper at a couple of hot, um, the Hotel Dieu and the Hotel Rin uh, in Dieppe. The uh, Rouen Hospital as well uh, cared for a lot of prisoners, especially those with, you know, uh, worse wounds, I suppose, uh, who needed extra assistance. And then in Paris, 
Um, and in Paris, uh, there was a couple uh, who had major surgeries, uh, specialized surgeries and that sort of thing. So right. that's the different areas in which the prisoners of war were cared for. Uh, the walking wounded or the or the people who were unscathed uh, were marched to Envermu, which is where the uh, German local headquarters was. And then they were marched eventually through Rouen and down to vernel sur evre And from there, they were sent on trains uh, uh, east uh, to Germany and to Poland. And you can see the number of locations they were sent to. We have Momoings, Belgium, um, noted on here near the center of the map below Brussels. Momoings is on the border between France and Belgium. And there's a, you know, the, the so the officers were in like second class cars on the trains, but the enlisted were all shoved in like the 40 and 8 box cars, like, yeah. you know, 40 doors is 80 guys, but they shove way more in than the, the 80 or whatever, right? And so, yeah. you know, very cramped conditions, um, very much, um, uh, you know, no water, you know, no food for extended periods of time, no hygiene breaks. And at, at, at Momoings, I think they actually stood in the hot sun for about eight hours or something like that, you know, just frying in those in those cars. And there's today that the Belgians uh, remember this and they have a memorial set up uh, to honor the Canadians um, who experienced this uh, during the course of their journey. Uh, the journey was a bit of a propaganda exercise too. They wrote, you know, Canadian schwein on the rail cars and other, you know, derogatory yeah. statements and kind of drove them through, you know, France, the occupied countries and into Germany to show people like this is, you know, again, Churchill's second front's already kaput and it became a propaganda exercise. Yeah. Um, where did they wind up? Well, if they were wounded, there were some um, prisoner of war kind of hospitals uh, in Germany. The, the officers ended up at the number two below Nuremberg. This is off leg 7B at Eichstatt. Most of the officers ended up there. Um, the enlisted primarily ended up at the number two over in Poland on the right hand side of the map. And that's Staleg um, 8B or Lambsdorff. Um, Eventually, many of them were moved to the number three that's up north of Berlin uh, at uh, Stargard uh, later in the war. Um, and those are some, some of the areas in which uh, these prisoners of war were, were kept. You know, some of them continued to try to escape. Uh, the number one, uh, which is uh, uh, the Stalag, it's in Poland um, on the right-hand side of the map. That's Stalag Luft three, the infamous uh, location of the Great Escape in 1944. There was an airman who was... Uh, shot down during the Dieppe raid, who was on the Great Escape, and he was captured and executed as a result of his um, participation in that escape attempt. Um, so just gives you an idea of where they were. If you click one more slide, Brad, we have um, a little bit of an addition to the map, which is an indication of where the major uh, death marches or winter marches were in 1945. You know, the red arrows indicating travel away from the Soviets in the east, and the blue areas indicating travel away from the Western allies uh, in the West. Um, so for instance, you know, it was a very different experience for the officers versus the enlisted because the officers were at number two down at the bottom of the map. Uh, and they were just, they didn't have to go as far of a distance to get away from uh, the Americans. Whereas the Canadians, most of whom were at the number three in the North, had a much further distance to travel to get away from the Russians um, as well. So uh, varying experiences that way um, as well. Some of the artifacts. Uh, we have this display case with a whole bunch of interesting uh, stuff. As I said, you know, the Red Cross parcels were really important. Um, you know, uh, it would give the prisoners, um, you know, extra things that they could barter away with the guards or with, you know, other prisoners perhaps, you know, for different bits of food or, or different little bits of equipment and that sort of thing. Um, again, uh, there's a number of postcards in this uh, display. Um, very important, the, you know, communication with home uh, for, mm -hmm. from the morale side of things. Um, actually, two of the postcards that are on the top of the display case, they are actually from two of the, um, uh, two of the Canadian uh, battalion commanders who were captured at Dieppe to their brigadier back in Ottawa, uh, brigadier, um, uh, trying to remember which one it is, I can't right now, I think it's, ooh, I wanna say it was Southam, but I might be wrong about that because I can't remember now which brigadier was captured because there was one that was captured, but the idea, you know, they, mm. they, they, they kept in touch, you know, with their, you know, with their, you know, senior officer there back in Canada. Yeah. And, um, you know, these were important components of, you know, keeping themselves sane. I think in one of the letters, one of the, um, officers talks about how uh, 
Um, it's not as bad for the older officers. They tend to be fine kind of waiting out the war, but the younger officers who have kind of more energy mm -hmm. and stuff, they, they're hit a little bit harder by the prisoner experience because yeah. they want to be active. They want to be doing things and, and, and getting a lot on with their lives and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, some interesting uh, bits and pieces uh, from, from our display uh, here for everybody to check out. Yeah, it'll be a good part to check and uh, get into some more details. So the last zone... Uh, and I'll try to wrap up pretty quickly, is all about remembering. And originally, we actually turned this zone from Dieppe to Juno um, because we wanted to bring everybody kind of full circle. And because right. the exhibition is called From Dieppe to Juno, we don't want to give people the impression that we're advocating that D-Day and Dieppe are, you know, completely linked and that, you know, it's right. a straightforward path from D-Day, from Dieppe yep. to D-Day. And it's not the angle no, we're taking on. This is an infographic that shows, you know, here are all the amphibious operations that occurred between the Dieppe Raid and D-Day. There yeah. were a number of them. They all had a very different purpose from Dieppe, which was we are there to stay and to fight the yeah, enemy. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> not going anywhere. And so there were lessons learned in all of these operations, you know, and some of them didn't go very well. You know, you've pointed out, I know that you've seen this before, Operation Sing Shingle isn't exactly an amazing example of an amphibious operation. I mean, the amphibious landing goes okay, but the stuff that follows not so good. Yeah, the beach um, landing was great. Yeah. <laughs> the rest, uh, not good. But the, the point uh, is there were lessons learned, you know, and even just things like, for instance, like yeah. a lot of the landing craft personnel were at all of these operations. And so they each had, you know, opportunities yeah. to yeah. learn more and more about what they were yeah. doing and how to do it before D-Day, right? And so those are some important points we, we want to make to ensure, well, you know, it's not a yeah, story. Sorry, just to jump in there though, yeah. but because that's always said, right? Like, why aren't they doing, you know, why didn't they do X? Why didn't they do, you know, this operation at this time or earlier? It's always because it's about there's lack of landing craft. And that is a perfect example of that because it's the same people yeah. running the landing craft. Like yeah. they literally there's photos yeah. of ones, I think I can't remember where it was destroyed. It might have been at Normandy, but it listed like Anzio, it listed like Avalanche, it listed Torch, and it, it's destroyed, yeah. but it's like that's literally where it had been. Like that is just it's a that's a perfect example. Yeah, they're constantly. Oh, it was self. Sorry, going back yeah. real quick. It was, was captured, so I'm trying to remember the other brigadier's name. And it's, yeah, it's, I can't remember. It's, it's, yeah. Maybe it's. Anyway, I can't um, remember. I'm bad for not Too remembering many names. that. But anyway. So yeah, anyway. just just some examples, and then the next slide we have some comparisons between um, the Dieppe raid in terms of numbers. You know, um, troops involved, casualties, equipment involved, and then we have Juno Beach beside that. And then we have the, you know, Operation Jubilee and Operation Neptune compared. And it's it's almost silly to put these two things side by side because they're just so different. So, but yeah. the scale is so much different, right? And even when you compare the Dieppe Raid to Juno Beach, you can see how much, you know, more support, yeah. more equipment was there. And we're not even talking about specialized stuff, right? We're not even talking about the, yeah. the bombardment force that was offshore in the case of Juno, right? And then... You know, the same with Operation Neptune. It was a huge logistical effort, um, you know, and then more and more troops would follow in the coming days, right? So mm -hmm. Operation Neptune, in a sense, was too big to fail. They made it so big that, yeah. you know, there's just the no way the Germans could have, could have, you know, defeated yeah. all the landings, right? Whereas, you know, and, and then the, the terrain is just so different, right? Like, Dieppe is just, you look at Dieppe and you're just like, why would you, why would you land here? And so sure, sure, there's some really bad spots on the Normandy beachhead as well, but nothing, nothing like Yeah, nothing, nothing like Dieppe. It's not even close. Like, sorry, I don't want to go off on a tangent, but it's not even close. And they knew all of this, but anyway, that could be, that could be another, another, another day. So the other thing we want to do in the exhibition is mm -hmm. kind of bring things full circle with the return to Dieppe in September of 1944, because ultimately, you know, Juno Beach and, and, and D-Day were about, you know, creating a bridgehead uh, in Normandy, building that up, defeating the German army and pushing them back or destroying them on the way yeah. to, you know, Berlin. You know, effectively, it was the, the ultimate goal. They didn't quite get there because of politics, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And um, the Dieppe raid... Um, is is commemorated in September 1944 when uh, the Second Canadian Infantry Division, the same division filled with some of the veterans mm -hmm. who survived both the EP and the Battle of Normandy, return um, to pay tribute to uh, their dead from you know almost two years, you know just over two years before. Um, it was very fortunate that the Germans had actually withdrawn from Dieppe the day before um, the Eighth yes. Reconnaissance Regiment showed up, yep. uh, because 
Um, there was a huge naval and air bombardment set to just level yep. the place. Uh, they would have loved the Germans it, yeah. to fight for it. And so that was called off with about 20 minutes to spare, which is amazing. Yeah, and which crazy. set the scene for, you know, um, two days later on the 3rd of uh, September, the Canadians, uh, Canadian Army has a ceremony at the cemetery, uh, you know, behind Dieppe. And then they have a march pass through the town where all of the, you know, the all of the troops uh, that are currently in second division are marching through the town and they're welcomed, you know, by the French civilians and thanked, um, you know, for liberating them. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's, it's quite the thing to bring everything full circle that way and to show that, you know, you know, the ordeal of the French, you know, again, it wasn't just the one day at Dieppe, although, you know, some French civilians were killed during the course of the raid, but also mm -hmm. they were occupied for over four years. And then finally in September 1944, that changes, um, which mm -hmm. is, so it's a really important um, point that we wanted to make um, in this exhibition to bring things full circle. There's a really great story as well about Creerar <laughs> and um, Montgomery and how uh, oh, Creerar right. actually misses a meeting for Operation Market Garden to come to the Misses. ceremony. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Misses meeting. the meeting. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's a complicated story, but anyway, yeah, it's a, yeah. I just, sorry, it, just to jump in, because I get asked, yeah. I've been asked this question in the, in the past, right? Because yeah. again, this is, this is some historiography, but like Creole Racinus, that's basically British toady. And we talked about it on the bit yeah. before, but, and then, he, he 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 wasn't, but it's complicated. But then again, there's this perfect example. Like Monty's like, do this, and Pierre's like, I can't hear you. <laughs> you, know, you know. Well, to me, it, just, it says a lot. Yeah. In the tradition of like Sir Arthur Curry from the previous war, he understands his roles yeah. as a national commander. Yeah. The yeah. ultimately the goal is to win the war and to be part of a coalition that's going to win the war. But there are times in which the national prerogative takes press, you know, pr exactly. you know priority. And in this case was one of them. And arguably Creerar felt that very strongly because, and he said something along the lines of, I have 800 reasons to be at Dieppe yeah. instead of with your meeting, yeah. because that's the number of Canadians who were killed during the raid. Um, and, um, you know, so he saw it as very important to, to, to be there. And, and I think he partially thought about that because, you know, part of it was his fault, right? Like he was part well, of the yeah, And so, yeah, you know, he probably felt it. personally it's, it's, he should be there, you know? Um, yep. He also was very much in the, along the, you know, if you read some of his messages to the troops before and just after D-Day, he mm -hmm. talks about how Dieppe is the lessons, you know, learned by the sacrifice of second division at Dieppe are going to help us, uh, you know, succeed yep. in, on D-Day, right? So, He's, you know, he's adopted that himself. Um, you know, I don't know if it's because he feels, he really feels like they've learned a lot of lessons or because it, he feels better about the situation. But nevertheless, right. it's all it's all linked together. And that's why, you know, again, from Dieppe to Juno is is, yeah. the, is the ultimate theme here, right? Yeah, and I want to reiterate too, because again, I'm, 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 I'm not part of this exhibit, right? Uh, is that there is that link. It's just what we think it is is or what's popularly said to have happened is not the case, but there are links. It's just not this. Yes. We had to do DF so we could save lives on, you know, on the Norman beaches. It's not quite that, but it, there are deep connections. It's just, you gotta, you gotta dig a little deeper, I guess, to, to understand them. That's yeah. The point I want to make. That's my own point. Not you. That's not the JBC saying that. That's just me. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but absolutely. And, and, and then we finish with like the legacies of Dieppe and yeah. um, you know, there's a lot of things here to, to unpack. Um, you know, the veterans carried many physical, emotional scars with them for years. You know, some of the, many of the veterans, mm -hmm. perhaps just like the Hong Kong veterans in some cases felt like they had been abandoned. Right. Um, yep. And certainly they didn't. I've seen it. Sorry, just to jump in. I've seen yeah. letters yeah. from both and they do say that. Yeah. And they, and they, they, they see, you know, in some of in some cases they feel like, you know, um, well, well, certainly they didn't get the benefits that they probably needed yes. um, in the post-war era, right? Because they had had right. different experiences than uh, some of the other um, people. Yeah. So they actually fought in the nineteen early 1970s, late 1960s for additional benefits alongside, you know, the Hong Kong veterans as well uh, for yeah. better pensions. And, and they succeeded in that. Um, and the, yeah. the, 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 the regime was one of the best, you know, prisoner of war uh, pension regimes in the world at the time, um, which was, which was great. It just took too long, as you've said, you know, to get there. Um, 
they they also felt slighted in some ways because there was no medal awarded um, yeah. for Dieppe right. until yeah. the Dieppe bar was added to the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal in 1991. And so Dieppe wasn't recognized as a separate, you know, campaign essentially or anything like that. It was just a one day yeah. thing and, and that was it. So, you know, perhaps they felt a little bit um, just, you know, not, not welcome in that sense. Um, Dieppe has always also been kind of a seen as a symbol of, you know, senseless carnage. Yep. Um, and I've got a really cool image, I think, that, that shows up in a second that, that speaks to this. But it fit well into a post-war Canadian nationalism that embraced yep. peacekeeping and downplayed our connections to the UK. And I would note, yet it was the Canadians, uh, Canadian pride in many ways that led to our involvement in the raid. So it's quite ironic that way, but that's kind of how it was it was talked about. And then a twisted version of this history arose in Quebec after the war, especially, right. you know, the quiet revolution, you know, during in the, in the separatist movement, the rise of the separatist movement, that the Fusilier Montréal had been sent to the slaughter by English Canadian generals willingly fighting for Britain. And that was seen as a, a measure of colonial oppression, right? And so we discuss that in, in our exhibit and talk about that. Um, and we also talk about this idea that only in the last 20 years or so has D-Day and Juneau Beach become more central to the Canadian memory of the Second World War than Dieppe. I think Dieppe was for a long time the most identifiable kind of battle the Canadians were involved in during the Second World War. I think it's still up there. I think it's still on like a top three list, but I think Juno yep, Beach oh, is sure. increasingly taking over that. And I, yeah, I would say I, so. Because again, I, yeah. sorry, as you know, I've looked at this, the memory of loss, uh, of army loss and all of that. And I would say that, that that's fair. With And it's been a concerted effort. It had to be because DEP was used, like you just said, for all kinds of, and quite frankly, nefarious reasons like groups. And, and, it, and it's changed. So uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I completely agree. And one thing I, before I forget, and what Sheldrake they was talking about earlier, and we were talking about is the memorials to the different nationalities. This is the aquatic center that's there now. It's on, yeah. if you can see my mouse moving, it's on this little building here around this side, it faces the beach. So if you want to ever see them, that's where most of them are, ah. and just along the wall there. Yeah. So that's where you go see well, them. So that's, uh, I, think, I think the aquatic center is fairly new, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, it's not too, too old. Um, it's on the grounds of what was the casino. There's another yeah, casino back down here somewhere. Because I was there in, <laughs> but, was there in 2011, and I don't remember it being there, but I could be. I might yeah, just it's not. Sure. Yeah, well, I was there in 2016, and it was definitely. Well, I mean, it looks more weathered because it's just literally next to the English Channel, so that does a number on buildings. But uh, but yeah, that's that's just where that spot is. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Thank you for pointing that out. And so a couple of other yeah, before anyway. the now photos here. For people to kind yeah. of look through um and, and some of these will give you kind of a sense of of what the canadians you know went through on yeah. the beaches as well uh there's i think blue beach might be next so is that yeah yeah yes yeah there's you know german propaganda photo of the of the carnage there um and just the narrowness of the draw right the narrowness of the of yeah. the way one of the few ways off the beach there just an you know, the only way they were ever going to succeed is if they got there and there was no opposition, basically. Um, yeah. It's 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 very 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 sad spot. And if you hit next again on the uh, on the slide, little story to share. So when I was last in Dieppe in 2011, I was there with Hannah Burnett, um, and Hannah good was it was, was a classmate of mine, and uh, she lost her uh, I think it was her great uncle uh, Jimmy Burnett at Blue Beach, and. You know, she wrote an article um, about him uh, in Canadian military history, and uh, she wrote, much as I try to understand the broader context of the raid, the conflict in history coupled with family memories make that almost impossible. On the beach that day, I discovered my connection to the story of a young soldier who died. That is the lens through which my family and I remember Jimmy. Mm -hmm. And so it just, it just shows that, like, you know, these ripples are still having impacts today, right? You know, people mm -hmm. still feel that loss today. You know, families still yeah. feel that loss of, you know, brothers, uncles, sons, you know, what have you, who, who never made it home. Um, and it was just, I just, you know, I'm a little worked up here because yeah, it was quite an good. emotional moment. Yeah, it happens to me too. Moment for our class on the beach there, right? And, you know, I remember myself at the time, I was very much enamored with the lessons learned argument and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she just had none of it. She was like, you know, it just, none of it made any sense. And um, yeah. 
And how could it, right? When there's there's yeah. so much sacrifice and loss. And so that's one of the things I like to point out about like the historiography of this subject is kind of we're all kind of decade over decade trying to re-ask and re-answer the question, like what right. was it all for? Yeah. Right? What was it all for? And you know, um, there's a number of, you know, depending on what your perspective is, maybe we found the answer with with David O'Keefe's thesis on the mm-hmm. on the Enigma machine. Maybe you know, the veterans in like the 90s and such, like um, uh, Dennis Whitaker certainly felt that it was a, you know, lessons learned thing yep. and that it had saved lives on D-Day. Um, yeah, he sure. kind of stood by that um, in, in his book. And he, his book is really weird, by the way. Um, uh, it's, it's, he's almost praising Churchill and the chiefs of staff for letting it go ahead so that they could learn the lessons, <laughs> even though they, they knew it might not work out very well. <laughs> It's, it's no, a, I know. A, I know. Again, that's the historiography, but of all people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. Sorry, he was there, right? But, so uh, it's, yeah. it, what do you say? You know? It's, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's a hard. difficult contested piece of history and, yeah. and it, you know, um, and, it, and it's tough and that's, you know, it's, it's a very difficult subject and that's, we hope that in our exhibit, we've done a good job of trying to kind of lay out some of the ideas and some of the, reasons potentially why it happened yeah. but we can't ultimately provide any you know full answers for people and we'll still be asking that question i think years from now um yeah. and it's always dieppe is always going to be part of our correct collective memory a significant part of our collective memory of the second world war as a result yeah and i think Wilson makes a really really good point here is yeah. and just generally is blue beach it, it yeah the photos that I had before, I, I could go back, but I mean, they're famous. You can find them easily online if you want to look at them and give them a real good look over. Uh, but it's just when you stand there and you see it even today, right? Because it's open as a beach, right? It's used as a beach. It's like, wow, um, this was, yeah. wow, uh, bad plan. Yes, yeah, so that's 2020, obviously, but just it's, it's more like exactly what you're talking about. I think that's a perfect point is the family connection, those who died what happened and then this whole i'll just call it a historiography fight that goes on today hasn't ended it's never going to end i don't think there's never going to be like this is the definitive dieppe story and this is the answer that's yeah. never going to happen no matter how many people research this to the nth degree i don't think it matters it's just that to me is blue beach is what that represents to me what happened there is is it's 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 striking i don't know what more to say yeah anyway I can't remember. What I, I must have another slide on artifacts here. In a I don't remember now either. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so really, this yeah. is what I was referring to. So there's the CVSM with the Dieppe uh, clasp and the yeah. and everything. So thanks to the Royal Canadian Military Institute for getting us one of those, a very well preserved one, I might add. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Or at least they cleaned it up very nicely. Um, this uh, sign on the right. This is actually from. It's once again we had to use a facsimile of it, um, but it's from the Canadian War Museum. Interesting. And it is a protest sign from the yeah. Afghanistan war. Mm-hmm. And it places Kandahar on a pedestal with the Epin Beaumont Hamel as suicide missions. And so re- regardless of what you feel about that, and I don't think Kandahar was a suicide mission by any stretch, and it doesn't really compare to the other two. It no. just shows how Dieppe has become, it is kind of that example of a suicide mission, yeah. you know, yeah, 100%. In, in, memory and how we use the war in the second world war in this case or the first world war in the case of bull on ml to to do our politics and to make political points oh yeah 100 and, and so that's that's what we thought was fascinating about this sign not that we agreed with the interpretation yeah of that but that it's it's been you know it's when you see it on a list you're not surprised it's there in terms of no. the suicide mission, right i mean it's just like you said. It's not an agreement. It's it's a a feeling like trying to get a feeling an artifact. It is you you know you interpret the artifact however you want. Whether you're a historian or not doesn't matter. You're going to interpret it. It's just it's and we you and me have talked about this. I know we have because we even talked about it when we were looking at some of the infographics that you wanted to you know look over a second opinion and the whole Beaumont and Mel even Diap thing to me is like I get it, <laughs> but I'm like we're different different poles here we are at different circumstances even different memory and how it's even remembered is different so i I mean i get obviously why and if it's a political protest they're trying to literally do something so that's why that that's the case but again it's just something i can't not think about again my own researching into hong kong right is the whole well what's the point you know what what do you get 
And it's like, like sometimes there is nothing to get. There is nothing. It was a mistake. Yeah. Bad things happen. Things go wrong. Sometimes there is no redeeming quality here. And, and I think it's it's an interesting way of yeah. displaying and, this. And kudos on you guys for for including it. I think it's it's a great way to do it. And, and with the app, there's there's almost no success, right? Unless you you know mm -hmm. agreed you know agree with the lessons learned piece. You know, they didn't get any Enigma stuff. The one thing they did get is a little bit of information on the Freya radar. Um, yes. At Port Mill, totally. they were able to, they weren't able to capture the radar station or the bunker. But what they, the, the radar technician was able to do was to cut the telephone lines and to force right. the Germans to communicate via radio right. who were operating that. And then the air battle was going on overhead. And so the Freya was tracking all these things. And so the, um, People who were listening, you know, to the Germans speak, you know, back in uh, in England, could help better understand what how the Freya worked and how it tracked various targets and that sort of thing. So, very right. minor example, right? Which did have some impact on the development of countermeasures for radar that actually are used on D-Day, which is like window mm -hmm. and, and and essentially the yeah. original version of like window. chat. Yeah. Um, but it's a very small piece of the of the puzzle, and it's certainly not the main reason they were there. Um, and and so it's it's difficult, right? There's you know, you know, very you know, very little came of this in a positive way. And on the lessons learned piece, and this is a personal thing, like I would argue, uh, there's there's an argument to be made, perhaps that the best you know you learn you learn lessons the best when there's a real blood price for it, maybe. But at the same time, none of these lessons required a blood sacrifice to really be no. learned. They were all fairly elementary. Um, and, uh, and at the end of the day, I mean, it's really, I think, the terrain that makes a huge difference here. Look, Juno Beach, mm -hmm. there are heavy casualties on Juno Beach. Um, oh, undeniable, yeah. You know, it's not nearly as heavy as at Dieppe, but there are heavy casualties on Juno Beach. And the bombardment fails for the most part. It Maybe it does a little suppressive effect but it ultimately doesn't do what was hoped for. Um, right. And they had, you know, the infantry had to take the beach with the support of maybe some tanks when they showed up and the engineers and, yep. you know, taking beachheads is tough. And, yeah. uh, you know, all those lessons learned, you know, and all the firepower brought to bear doesn't change the fact that, you know, it's going to be a tough fight. So. I mean, yeah, that's a great point. And I mean, like, well, Dave makes another point here, like gunners learned about, well, yeah, the, the foods yeah. and how many more yeah. there were, were and all. But I mean, yeah, that's learned from DF. I mean, the one that always sticks out to me is the engineering thing because there's literally like physical examples of, of, of the AVRs, right? It, 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 it's like the AVR East, sorry, uh, of what that means. Like there's physical representations, right? Like we're not going to have our engineers running up the beach with the infantry. Like we're going to put them in a tank and we're going to get them just if they can't take well, it out, they're going to shoot it, you know? <laughs> And at the same time, they still had engineers running up the beach with the infantry on D-Day. Like they, they did. I was doing yeah, that research did. in the Mike Red sector, and there's 19 engineers with the uh, B Company of the Royal Winnipeg Rifles. None of them are very well trained in terms of being infantry. They're they're all you know they're 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 technicians. They're plumbers. They're you know they're not trained to the same standards as an assault infantry, right. and yet they're still thrown in, and they take heavy casualties. They do right. I mean, there's um, it's just, footage it's just, of them training that. It's just kind yeah. of mind-boggling when it's, you think about it. It's but. just the fact that they succeeded and were able to you know, get off the beach. Yeah. That means that it doesn't become complete carnage, right? And, right. and Dieppe is just, the terrain in particular for me is just, there's so few opportunities to get off the beach yeah. and to go anywhere that that's, that that's part of the problem. Is is It's just the wrong place to land. Yeah, and it's... And, but uh, that's part of the whole, again, the debate that's been going on ever literally since it happened about why, right? Is it worth it? You know, was it worth it in the long run? Obviously not because they didn't succeed, but you don't know until after. But anyway, we could talk about that forever. Um, was there any last slides? Yeah, I think this is yeah. interesting. Thing to Just, add here. I mean, I don't agree with everything Brian Loring Villa writes, that's for sure, but I agree with this. <laughs> um, you know, disasters bring us face to face with the limits of our abilities to offer explanations, and I think that's um, a good summary of the exhibition, right? Like, we're not trying to be definitive here, we're just yep. trying to tell the story as best we can and to try to give some voices to some other pe some people who don't always get a voice. And I, I, the couple things I wish I'd do a better job in this presentation going forward is one is. And it was a long presentation anyway. 
One is like the civilian angle and talking about right. their experience. I think that's very important. And the other is just the, the variety of voices and what they're saying about their experience on the raid or their, um, uh, you know, their reactions to it at home um, or, you know, in whatever proximity they are to the raid. So, uh, but at the end of the day, um, it's again, that theme of, you know, maybe we'll never know exactly what the DF raid was, was, was all about. <sighs> Well, and like, I mean, I think I may add into it outright, but talking about like the loss, the personal connection that you were talking about, at some points for some people that it's not going to matter. It doesn't matter, right? That relative still died, right? Yeah, uh, yeah great. Uh, maybe there's an explanation. But also, like I was saying before, because again, as you all know, who have been following me for years now, I've been thinking about this for a long time. Because Hong Kong, right? W nothing. There is nothing redeemable about that. Mm -hmm. That happens. And it sucks. Yeah. And it's awful but it happens and we need to learn but sometimes i think uh, i think um, the great dominion said something sometimes you can't wallow in defeat you gotta try to maybe find a silver lining but sometimes the silver lining is going to be tiny and not do too too much but that's what it's going to be and i don't know that's just something as someone who yeah. uh, has thought about canadian defeat especially in, in the second world war a lot uh, that's what i think and again i could be wrong but that's what i think um yeah and this is <laughs> sorry why else why i laughed when i first saw this and just now <laughs> sure it's on fire today because it's just true i was like oh that's that's bold that's bold but again yeah he's right here i mean the rest of it's kind of uh anyway um now we talked you and me talked about this before I, I i was gonna send you a private message but i'll just ask you a uh, question from scott who is a great supporter of the channel that's why i just didn't want to fluff him off and he's been a great supporter of mine the plan development near the JBC. Did you want to talk about that slightly? I mean, I know you can't, there's certain elements you cannot talk about uh, because of there's legal reasons. Do you want to take a minute to talk about that? If you don't want to, you don't have to. I what's, just what's the specific, what's the specific question? Um, just about the plan development near the JBC. <laughs> very, very general. Um, so what I and can say. Good way there, Scott. Good way of. Uh, yeah. What I, what I can say is this is. Um, the plan development um, is going to have a significant impact on how we how we remember uh, on the beach in at Juno. Um, it's going yeah. to uh, firstly, if the development goes ahead, um, it's going to be very difficult to have VIPs in the area for major events because it is a four story condominium complex, and that could have implications mm -hmm. for our ability to have VIPs on the beach there. Um, Beyond that, it's really just the chaos of the road and 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 what might happen in terms of you know us losing business in terms of our visitors not being happy with the situation, um, yeah. and, and, and 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 the damages that will result from that, you know, could impact our ability to you know do our day to day day job, which is to transmit memory and remembrance activity uh, in the Normandy region, and ultimately. Um, our veterans uh, who established the museum, they did so because they wanted to make sure there was always a place, a site of memory, a place for Canadians to go and for other people to go to learn about Canada in the Second World War um, on Juneau Beach. And, you know, this project, there's a chance that it could be an existential threat uh, to the museum. Um, and it will absolutely change the way we go about uh, doing our business and uh, remember uh, you know, and, and preserve their legacy. And it's, it's their legacy that's at stake here. And, and that's all I want to say right now. Um, yeah, but yeah. we're going to have more, you know, keep, 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 stay tuned. The big thing is we need Canadian support. Um, there's a citizens campaign, savejunobeach.ca. If you haven't seen it yet, go there, check it out. Um, they're trying to support us as best they can to, 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 to galvanize public support in Canada to say, you know, this is wrong. We need to do something about this. Um, and also, um, basically, we've been dealing with this legal situation for over two years, and it's been a drain on our bank account, essentially. Right and we need to build a emergency yeah. fund to help uh, support us in uh, the continuing fight against the, the uh, against um, the danger uh, that every that the situation mm -hmm. poses uh, uh, to the museum. So, if anybody can spare some change, you know, we'd really appreciate it. And um, yeah, that's that's really all I want to say at this point. But uh, I think yeah. I think over the next, you know, this this isn't going to end. You know, tomorrow this is going to take quite a while to resolve itself, and so there'll be more yeah. information, more uh, more uh, news in the future. Okay, that's good because yeah, because Scott Scott is right. Um, 
Yeah, Scott's a great guy. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna throw it up here. He did. He didn't want to put you in a bad situation. Of course, that's not. I know that's not Scott. That's Scott. That's not Scott as a person, because uh, I've got to know him. Uh, it's it it's because it, it just the G- JBC. You guys tweeted about it. That's all. And it's just because it's been out there. You guys have been trying to explain it, and I think very very well um, about what's going on and then what's at stake. And I mean, again, this is just me. It's just it sounds not a good situation. <laughs> As someone who knows people who've worked in construction sites and live near some of them, they're not safe. <laughs> you don't want to, it's just not safe. Uh, and it's just, it, that's an issue. And I completely understand that. It's just, and well, there you go. Well, that was easy. Um, just donated to the center. Uh, I can add some links. Thanks, uh, I, I, can, uh, I can, yeah, I'll add some links down below. Uh, to the, I already put the, 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 the yeah. after two hours, I can't talk. I put the link to the new exhibit, but I can, Put more down below in the description where all the other links for everything else is uh, to everything. Just so have people watching this in the future can can check those out. Uh, so yeah, is that it? I think that's that's it. It's been um, two hours. <laughs> I guess I wasn't expecting to go that long, but it's good. I, I don't care. I'll talk all day. You got to tell me to shut up. That's the problem. Uh, so yeah, anything else? Any closing thoughts, or is that it? Just help this. No, I mean, can. thanks I so much. Fun. Thanks so much for having me. I hope. Um, you know, part of the reason why the situation in France is so grim right now is because we're, you know, hopefully just coming out of COVID-19 um, and, and getting yeah. the tourism industry back, you know, going again. Yeah. And, you know, we'd really like to see more and more Canadians, you know, plan visits and and, and, and yeah. hopefully this Dieppe Expo gives you another incentive uh, to maybe <laughs> go out there and visit us. And yeah, uh, yeah I mean, there's going to be more news uh, about the exhibition and certainly more images and stuff available. Um, hopefully we'll have some educational resources uh, oh, prepared. Uh, we have great. two really amazing, um, two really amazing propaganda videos, one from each side um, yeah. that were yeah. created in the, in the, in the um, aftermath of the DDF parade. And we're going to b- hopefully build those into some educational resources to teach oh, about uh, propaganda. So you keep an well, eye on those. Yeah, that's great. And I'll share what I can uh, when I see it. I can't. Thing, even though it seems like I live on Twitter, I kind of do, but <laughs> I'll share what I can. Um, but uh, what I was going to say, yeah, there's the, the French one that's directed towards the local populace is on my channel. I don't know if I linked the playlist down below. I can't remember, uh, but it, it's striking to, to to watch and the language used and, and everything. Anyway, that's just a bit of plug for me. Uh, anyway, I'm just going to do a quick sign off and then I'll come say goodbye and we'll log off for today. All right. We'll, we'll get you back in a second here, Alex. Uh, so thanks everyone for watching. Yeah, it was a longer one. I think it's one of the longest ones I've ever done. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone for the, the great comments and all the support. Uh, again, Alex doesn't put me up to saying anything. Anything I say is just my own opinion, my own understanding of situations. That's it. Uh, I don't have any association other than some freelance work I've done for the JVC and some coming up, but this is all my own opinions. So don't, if I, you don't like what I said, it's not reflective on them. This is all me. Uh, but support them if you can. If you can give a little bit, it it, it is important. Uh, as someone who is relying on these kinds of things myself, it, I know how important these things can be and what it means more than just sometimes money. Uh, it's just the support and everything, um, especially in Canada. For this center, that is so important. I know some people have different opinions about it. That's fine and dandy. You can always allowed to have your own opinion, but this is, this is literally a center of remembrance and, and having been there myself and having lost a relative just one town over on D-Day, it's just so important to have something like this. Canada has an issue with memory with the second world war. I'm, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's, it's so important and having something like this is needed. We need literally a center that we can have something to come around. And this is the best thing that can happen for that. And it, it just gives a center. Sorry, I'm emotional thinking about the, the relative and all the losses and everything. And, and something if this disappears, that's a tragedy to me. Uh, anyway, so if you can support the, the JBC as much as possible, they have lots of great ways, lots of great things you can do to help them. Uh, so please check those out. Uh, so my own little pitch, if you want to help the channel in any shape or form, like, the videos is great sharing them is awesome please subscribe if you haven't done yet so uh this is all just part of stuff on how youtube works the more uh interaction there is with things like the likes and everything the more people will see my stuff and the, and the channel can keep growing which i i do need help with uh, and things like patreon are huge helps to me for just a few bucks a month uh, like 350 canadian so for some of you americans and brits that's not very much <laughs> so if you can get a little bit of help that would be Great, just help me keep doing this because I got some big plans coming up. Uh, for those of you who don't follow me on Twitter and just on YouTube, I've got a big plan coming for June about Normandy. It's going to be 
be the biggest thing I've ever done. So uh, any any help you can get is is great. Uh, so check it out. All everything's linked below. I'll add some stuff after, particularly about the JBC and anything you can to uh, to help them is is amazing. And will help everyone in memory of Canada's and you know involvement in the Second World War generally is something that is very much needed. I'll just say it again. We need to do more, and that's one way we can. Oh, Thanks. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I, I didn't want any, you know, in you know, calls later. That, you know, he's the puppet of the JDC or something stupid. I'm like, this is just me. This is how I feel. People, I don't really hold back my opinions as people. I think are stirring. Um, uh, to know that, so uh, that's good. But uh, anyway, yeah, I just I wanted to have my own say there because I think it's important to show that the citizens should care more. We don't do enough. I'll just keep saying that again and again, probably till I'm a very old man, hopefully. Uh, it's just, we need to do more. Uh, and this is a perfect thing to coalesce around. So uh, again, thanks for coming on. I do appreciate it. It's a weekend. I know you are very busy, particularly right now, but uh, it's, it's uh, very much appreciated. So thanks again, Alex. Well, no, thanks for having me. And just to reiterate that point, look, um, you know, as you say, uh, our memory of the Second World War, it took us a while to get there and to really get things going. And it would be a real shame for kind of our primary site of remembrance overseas to be impacted in such a negative way. Yeah. Um, and the other thing I want to do is plug you uh, and the work you've done for us. Okay. And thank you again, because, you know, you did the podcast with us back in December for the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Hong Kong. And you've also written a very nice yeah, article sure. on the subject for our website. And so uh, you know, if anybody's interested in Brad's stuff, you should check those things out because they've really added a key piece um, of the war that we were missing from our website in, in, in past years. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you again for the opportunity. It was great. Obviously, I, I will never stop talking about Hong Kong either. Uh, but it was it's great to to get to do it in a different format as you, everyone is coming to learn that I love doing it in any way, shape or form I can. So it was great to talk about that and great to talk about Juno Beach Center because, again, it's uh, something really important to me, obviously. So, uh, yeah, I'm not too sure what I got coming up next. I, I've got some planning to do. It's just been kind of a busy period for me. So uh, just keep tuned for everything on social media and on here as well. Uh, um, for things coming up but uh, other than that everyone else have a good rest of your saturday and i'll see you next time thanks, thanks everybody a bit slow so everyone have everyone uh, good rest of your weekend everybody